Council members Dixon? Good. Here. Martinez? Here. Ortiz? Here. Powell? Here. Rauschenberger? Here. Stefan? Here. Thorin? Here. Mayor Captain? Here. Approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of uh, March 6th. So moved. Second. Moved and second for approval. Any corrections or additions? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council members good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, motion's approved 8-0. Uh, um, we have no public comments this evening. Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The first item is on both agendas. This is the Riverside Water Treatment Plant main switchgear improvements. This is change order number two. The city awarded the switchgear improvements uh, contract to John Burns Construction of Orland Park last September. The project includes replacing the main switchgears and unit substations located in the Riverside Water Treatment Plant. During the course of construction, several issues were encountered that require adjustment to the contract value, including additional buildup in the generator cooling system that was observed, recommended safety improvements to the switchgear, and an unexpected utility conflict and change required by ComEd after the project had been bid. Staff recommends awarding change number two in the amount of $211,000, $211,356 to John Burns Construction of Orland Park. Again, this item is on both agendas. Okay. Any questions for the manager at this time? Hearing none, Mr. Manager, move on. Thank you, Mayor. Item B is a presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about the water intake studies and soil boring findings from the Lincoln Lovell Saddle in the Fox River. This evening, Water Director Nora Bertram will be discussing the differences between the Water Master Plan Interim Report developed with EEI Engineering that was presented to the City Council in September 2023 and the draft Elgin River Intake Improvements Report commissioned in 2018 with Burns and McDonald Engineering. Ms. Bertram is going to be discussing why the Burns and McDonald Report was never finalized and how that report's water intake analysis differs from that performed by EEI. She will also be providing supplementary information on EEI's 2023 interim report as it relates to the draft Burns and McDonald report. After that, we're going to hear from EEI geologist Tim Holdeman. He'll be discussing the results from the soil borings taken from the Lincoln Lovell saddle in the Fox River at the end of last winter or at the end of last year. And then finally, Public Services uh, Director Mike Pubins will be talking about his most recent conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers and the timelines, the, the immediate timelines that we have with decision making relating to the dam. So, good evening, Ms. Bertram. How are you, Nora? Thank you. I appreciate the, um, the opportunity to present this information. Um, so I'm just going to get into it. So overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, Rick already kind of covered this. Uh, introductions, um, our geologist from EEI, Tim Holdeman, um, and then comparison of the reports, the soil borings, and then we'll have um, questions and answers for everyone. Um, so starting off with a comparison of the reports, a uh, reminder, the comprehensive master plan is still in progress. Um, we had done an interim presentation in September, and then we're looking at the draft study that had been commissioned in 2018. Um, so the, I'm just going to talk about the purpose of the two reports. So the purpose of the two reports is uh, different. The 2019 draft study commenced in 2018 with the draft report submitted in 2019. Uh, the purpose was to propose alternatives to address the siltation concerns at the intake. Um, prior to 2018, basically ever since Riverside had been constructed, we've dealt with siltation at the intake. Um, and we had commissioned Burns McDonald to look into uh, F or ways we could mitigate the siltation problems. The siltation causes um, problems such as uh, silt getting into our basins. Um, in the wintertime, um, we had a, a an incident with icing that we've since resolved by adding mixers at the intake to keep the water moving. Um, and then um, just the, the siltation itself, you know, building up in front of the intake. The intake's position in a location that encourages the siltation. Um, the 2019 draft study also, at the very end of the scoping, we did discuss considering the future dam removal impacts. Um, at the time this report was prepared, there was no pending talk of the dam being removed. Um, it was merely me and the former director kind of thinking, hey, if this dam is ever called for a big repair and someone says, why don't we just remove it? We want it to have in our back pocket. This is what we would have to think about. 
So it wasn't in, um, in direct response to anything. The comprehensive master plan then, um, obviously we've talked a lot about all of the components of the comprehensive master plan. I'm just gonna focus on the intake part of it. Uh, planning for the comprehensive master plan began in 2018. Um, it was around the same time as this draft study was implemented. Um, the this agreement for the comprehensive master plan was signed in August of 2022 with the interim presentation in September of 2023. Um, some of the goals of the intake portion of the comprehensive master plan were to review the draft study and kind of flesh out those recommendations, um, review the hydraulic model that was done as part of the draft study, and then do a source water assessment for our community, which we did address in September, and the impacts of the dam removal on our source water. Um, just for a timeline, the scoping letter was received from the Corps of Engineers discussing the dam removal in June of 2022. So right before the comprehensive master plan kicked off, but after the Burns and McDonald study was, was submitted. Um, so hydraulic model results, um, there's been some discussion on the difference in the hydraulic model results. I'm just gonna briefly discuss why they're different. Um, the 2019 draft study predicted a water level drop of just over one and a half feet at the intake. Um, the, the flow that they used in the, in the draft study was taken from a dry weather period in 2018. Now, if you think back to 2018, it was a pretty wet time. Since then, 2021, 20, 22, 23 have been really dry. So their flow that they used was 744 CFS. You might recall from the EEI presentation that they've been using a low flow of 100 CFS. Um, that's called, it's a statistical flow called the 7Q10. It's the lowest, um, well, Tim could probably explain it better. Um, and just for reference, in September of 2023, uh, flow measured at the South Elgin Gauging Station was 215 CFS. So that 744 CFS is really not um, representative of low flow in the Fox River. Um, we saw that last summer. Uh, and then the downstream water surface elevation, and this gets into hydraulic modeling. Um, for those of you who care or know about it, hydraulic models are built from the downstream up, and there is a a boundary condition at the downstream, kind of a starting point where um, you start there and then you build up and you calculate how the water surface level raises from that. So the boundary condition that Burns and McDonald used used a 10-year flow level at the Kimball Street Dam, which was a flow equal to a flow of almost 7,000 CFS. So 10 years is a, a flood, right? Um, had they used a water surface elevation equivalent to that 744 CFS, um, their boundary condition would have been seven and a half feet lower than the one that they used. So it was, I mean, that was a mistake. It was not uh, an accurate representative of, or representation of what should have happened. Um, EEI used their water surface elevation um, at the low flow of 100 CFS, so even lower. Um, and then just to focus, EEI was looking at a worst case scenario. We have to look at worst case scenarios. We have to be able to provide water in a drought. So that's the difference between the two hydraulic models. Um, next, we're gonna go through recommendations. So again, 2019 draft study was prepared to address siltation. Um, several of the, the options that they presented um, included coarse air bubble diffusers, rock groins, um, and annual dredging. Um, dredging, it was roughly every nine months is what they estimated. Um, and those prices ranged from 4.3 million to $101 million over the next uh, dredging was over 20 years. Um, so, you know, significant difference um, in prices. Um, the bubble diffusers and the rock groins, obviously on the lower end, um, the goal of the rock groins would be to guide the channel over. The goal of the coarser bubble diffusers was to move the silt um, away from the front of the intake. None of those addressed the dam removal. Those were strictly um, designed to address the siltation issue. They would be dependent on a flow in the river that did not lower the river intake level. Um, then they looked at a really conceptual plan for relocating the river intake just across the river from Riverside, basically on the bike path um, and on top of our wells at Slate Avenue for $13.8 million. Um, what they did, I just highlighted a statement in their study, um, removal of the Kimball Street Dam would have a major impact on the sustainable use of the river intake. So that was a quote from their, their report. Um, the comprehensive master plan then, as was part of their, their scope, reviewed some of those um, 
those recommendations. Uh, they did, again, the rock groins. They looked at extending the intake pipe into a deeper part of the channel, which would work to uh, the rock groins, again, to address siltation. Extending the pipe would um, help with the siltation if you get the intake out of the silt, but it also is dependent on that water level staying high enough to draw into the intake. It doesn't work if the water level's low. Um, armoring the saddle, I'm gonna let Tim talk about the saddle, but that was um, two to six million dollars and that was really dependent on the saddle being able to be armored. Um, and then annual dredging, um, they actually looked at that 92 to 101 million and they um, thought that the volume that Burns McDonald was using was a lot higher than it actually needed to be. That's why the numbers went down. And then the relocated river intake, um, they used uh, inflation and it got bumped up to $18.2 million. Um, we should note that now we're in the process of getting a project together to firm up those numbers. And looking at the location that had been proposed straight across the river from Riverside isn't super practical. So we're thinking it's gonna have to go further south, which is probably gonna increase that cost even more. And that's why you've heard numbers going up from that $18.2 million. And then a quote from their comprehensive master plan, the dam removal impacts on the river intake, positives. Improve habitat, improve connectivity, reduce sedimentation. The negative is it decreases the pool elevation. And with that, I'm gonna turn over um, the presentation to Tim. We will hold uh, questions if that's okay till the end. So thank you. Thank you, Nora. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Nora mentioned, um, using the existing riverbed profile that has uh, an increase in elevation or a saddle was one of the most economically attractive alternatives that we were looking at. The idea is that even if the dam were removed, that this saddle would cause the water to back up and maintain the pool so that we could maintain the current river intake structure. So the question becomes, if the dam is removed, would the saddle remain or would it be eroded away? And so the way to um, understand that better is to do uh, drilling, uh, borings into uh, the riverbed and to characterize that material to see whether or not it would be uh, removed. So uh, we will start with an overall uh, map that shows the water treatment plant and the Fox River intake, as well as the Kimball Street Dam. The uh, shaded relief of the riverbed is shown and it is colored so that the deepest part is light blue and the shallowest part or highest elevation is the pinkish purple, okay? So you notice right away uh, in the upper right of that um, yellow rectangle, there is a light blue area. That's a channel, that's a deep channel. And then also notice that from Kimball Street Dam a north, there's another channel coming up, that light blue. And then where those two would intersect is a darker blue, and that represents the saddle. That's the high point in that channel, from a deep channel to the north, up over the saddle, and then a deeper channel to the south. So let's look at a little bit more, uh, an enlarged portion of the map that's identified there in yellow. Uh, that's shown here, again, uh, the light blue on the north to the north and the light blue to the south, and the saddle. It is the high point of that uh, riverbed bottom. And we show on this then the five borings that were done. Those borings were advanced to 10 feet, RB1 to the west, 2, 3, 4 to the east, and then RB5, uh, not within the line, but in an area where, again, there was a higher elevation and we wanted to characterize that material. But our primary focus here was to collect sediment samples 
of the river bottom along the saddle. And so you see that these borings are right on top of that saddle. This is the same information, but not colorized. Rather, it's showing the elevation. And so out by RB5, you see the elevation is about 708. So the water level at that time was 710.8 or so. That um, river bottom is 708, so two and a half feet of, of water depth right there, very shallow. Uh, and then over uh, by the transect, it's a little bit deeper, four to five feet. So relatively shallow and not a lot of relief uh, in that, uh, along that transect one through four. This is uh, the map from the geotechnical report done by GSG consultants. They are a geotechnical engineering firm. Uh, they had uh, the drill rig and the barge, um, and they had two geologists on site, geotechnical experts, that logged the samples and recorded the information that I'm uh, going to share with you now. So this is uh, the boring uh, from RB1. That's the boring to the west and the location map is shown on the upper right. The top of this boring uh, shows general information. It was done, the boring was taken in mid-December, uh, if you recall that, and it was uh, using mud rotary techniques to advance the drill hole. A geoprobe was the type of drill rig um, it shows the elevation there, 710. That is the water elevation, along with the size of the hole, three and a quarter inches. As we go down into uh, the, the information, we have uh, left to right, we have the depth. So that's the depth from the top of the barge. So there was a little bit of air, and then we into the water, and then into the sediment. Then there's the graphic log. And in this particular log, we have a foot of sand, and that's represented by the dots. And then we go into about four and a half feet of organic clay. That's represented by the horizontal dashes. And then under that was a gravelly sand. So there's the sand that's stippling again, but this time you see the larger uh, circles or irregular uh, forms. That's the gravel, so gravel is a little bit bigger than sand, right? It's uh, like pea gravel is, is the size of a pea. Um, so that's, that's gravel. The next column is a description of that material. And so that's where we get some insight uh, into uh, what was found. And I'm gonna skip that just for a minute and go to the next column, which is the sample number, sample type number. SS1 is a split spoon. This is a two-foot-long um, uh, tube that has two halves. That's why it's called split spoon, because you can open it up. And so you put it together, and then you advance it using a standard 140-foot weight that's dropped 30 inches. And then it's hit onto the, the, the metal rod, which advances that sampling tube. Okay? So this is all standard, it's called the standard penetration test, uh, and it's documented through the ASTM, or American Society of T Testing Materials, and it's done the same way everywhere so that we can compare things. So then you have the next column, which is the percentage of recovery, and so out of that two feet, how much material was recovered, so if it's 50%, then that spoon would have recovered 50% of the material, and then the last is the blow counts, and that's the number of uh, drops of the hammer to advance by six inches. So you see uh, that first one is zero, 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 zero. That it went uh, without even any hammering, just the weight of the tube and the rod just sunk right into the, uh, into the sediment. And it did that again for the next two feet, just sunk down in. 
And then in split spoon three, we hit it four times and it went six inches, seven, 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 and that's your two feet. And then that 14 in parentheses is the second and the third measurement added up together. Okay. Um, in the range of 20s is kind of medium dense, and then above 20 would be a little bit more dense. So this is very soft material. And we see now as we jump back to the material description, we have sand at the top followed by the organic clay, and it's described here as soft and very moist. And then below that is the gravelly sand, medium density, and then the, the last sample is loose to medium dense. So we don't see anything that would um, uh, be uh, extreme, hard or competent or uh, be able to resist erosion in this particular boring. We go to boring number two, which is the next one to the west. Again, we have a very similar uh, result. We have that little bit of sand at the top followed by the organic clay, and then the sand and gravel with a little bit of sand. So we see a very similar, so which is expected, right? Geology is horizontal, and so uh, that was not unexpected. As we go to RB3 now, we see a very different result. We see approximately eight feet of sand. Underneath, and then underlaying underneath that is some clay. That clay, I will say, is uh, it's characterized as stiff, but only eight blow counts in the eight in parentheses. So it's not very um, uh, it's it's not very uh, dense. It's it's very loose. Okay, and so that that is the one uh, result that was. Uh, much different than the other two. Then we go to RB4, and we see again that same characteristic of this time instead of clay, it's silt underlain by clay. Silt is just a little bit uh, larger grain size, still very small. So instead of the sand, you have the silt, the clay, and the sand and gravel. Okay? And again, nothing. Uh, significant in terms of density. That sand and gravel, uh, very dense, it had a 57. So yes, that sand and gravel was very hard in this particular uh, sampling. And then the fifth one is that one that's off of line uh, and it has sand over clay. That is a sandbar. So uh, we eliminate that uh, from possibility of of something that would withstand, uh, withstand erosion. So that's the result, and as a geologist, uh, my tendency is to uh, look at these things uh, together and to try to make sense of, of what the data are telling us. And so we have that transect, RB1 through 4, and then we show in blue the Fox River with that sand that we identified, RB4, it's replaced by silt, and then the organic clay, which was consistent between one, two, and four, but three was very different, and then the sand and gravel underneath that. And so it looks, uh, it appears as if um, RB3 was drilled right in that channel that comes through the saddle, and uh, if the dam were to be removed, uh, that material would likely be eroded away. There's nothing here, no bedrock, no glacial till, nothing that's hard enough to withstand uh, the power, the erosive power of a storm event in which you have uh, large uh, volumes of water at high velocity. And so uh, that is our conclusion as a result of the boring data. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, just quickly before we get on to questions and answers, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the commitment process. There's been discussions on when and how does the city have to commit to either removing the dam or keeping the dam. So 
as I said, it's a two-stage process through the Corps of Engineers. The first stage is the Corps of Engineers will ask us to sign a letter of intent. That letter of intent will ask us, it's a non-binding commitment, uh, asking us if we wish to continue to participate in their study. If we say yes, they will keep this, the Kimball Street Dam in their study. That will allow them to keep it in the final report that goes to Congress that they will use to request funding for further design and implementation. If we say no, they take it out of the report and it's done. So, but again, if we say yes, that we wish to remain in the report, in the study, it's non-binding. It doesn't lock us into one, a yes or no decision. The second stage then, should we say yes, we want to stay in the report, the second stage would come about a year from now in what is called, excuse me, I need to refer, a project partnership agreement. That is a binding agreement that then if we said we wish to have the dam removed, that agreement would be, an intergovernmental agreement is a term we use very frequently. That would lay out the terms and conditions of how the agreement works, who's responsible for what, et cetera. And that would be the time where the city would have to say yes or no. We want to participate and have the dam removed under the Corps of Engineers project, or no, we want to keep it and it becomes ours. Well, it is ours, we own it right now. So. <clears throat> Mr. Poopins, could you explain what the next process is with, uh, with the water department now? Following the determination on the soil borings, what's the next course of action? Well, we've started to have discussions with engineering enterprises to look at a more detailed study for the relocation of the water intake. Uh, once we have that, we would use it to, again, weigh our options moving forward, in particular the costs and the timelines. Uh, I'm also working with the engineering firm that does our annual dam inspections to try to put some numbers on what we might see for future costs should we keep the dam. We know that we'll have annual inspection costs. At some point, we would expect to have some sort of maintenance project and take it far enough out, we would have a major reconstruction or replacement. So as part of, a, again, what I would call somewhat the engineering process, we're in the data collection and analysis phase. We want to bring that back to you with, again, different, the analysis of the problem, what we believe the options are, and if you so request our opinions on what the better options might be and what the less appealing options might be. So we've covered three big topics tonight, the, the previous report, the soil borings, and the commitment process. But okay. Any questions for the presenters at this time? I guess you'll have to call them up depending on what your question is. Ms. Paul. Yes, thank you. Um, and this is for you, Mike, so sure. you're right, right there. Um, in terms of the steps that you mentioned, um, what is the timeline around those? Did, you didn't really mention, is it like April? I mean, what, what's the kind of timeline? I believe it's reasonable that we would be bringing a, an engineering services agreement to you by May. For, and with EEI? For, with EEI, and would want to have the study substantially complete by midsummer. I'm gonna, I, I don't want to give a firm date because we haven't quite nailed that down with them. Uh, for the dam, it's the future dam costs, should we keep it? Uh, I hope to have an item on the next cow agenda. I'm working with Collins Engineers on a scope of services and again, another engineering services agreement for them to put that report. So uh, April for that and then I would say probably again early summer when we'd have that. So I think as a team, our goal is to have a significant amount of these questions answered by summer. That's a pretty broad target, I know, but. And in terms of the letter of commitment, the non-binding one with mm -hmm. the Army Corps, that time frame was? They told, when I, I spoke to them last week, they said they hoped to have that to us uh, for discussion in April. That was April, yes. and then the next one that was binding is? Spring of 2025. I don't have a firm date for when that would be required. And just uh, one note on the letter of intent. So the letter of intent has to be signed by the owner of the dam. 
So you may have heard that the Illinois Department of Natural Resources has already submitted some of those letters to the Corps of Engineers. I think Geneva, uh, there was an article in the paper recently that uh, the IDNR has, has already signed the letter of intent for Geneva. It's because IDNR owns, the state owns that dam. Because we're the owner of the Kimball Street Dam, we will need to sign a letter of intent should, if we choose to do so. So the owner of the dam has to sign it. So they're working on a draft, they'll get that to me and that will be brought before the council for consideration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else along this way? Questions? Uh, Ms. Rochenberg. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think we're all learning more about uh, water and hydrology <laughs> and dams than we ever thought. Um, my question is about, one is about um, one question is where the um, intake is now compared to the saddle. Is it in the saddle? Far from it or? Yeah. It's on that first slide, isn't it? Right there. Yeah. So um, the saddle is in the, the yellow box there and then the intake is where it's pointed so it's upstream of the saddle. So if you can see where Lincoln and Lovell Street are labeled, the saddle pretty much splits a line right between those two. And then you'll see the intake as you go upstream. It's labeled Fox River Water Intake. Oh, I see, okay. The scale is on the lower left. Okay. That bar is 1,600 feet total. All right. So it's so there's two miles there. And you chose the saddle to do borings because that's the deepest place in the river? It's the shallowest place in the oh, river. The it's the highest point, which would create the best pool conditions. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and the silting, um, there's a cost, annual cost, to remove the silt where the current uh, intake is? Um, so currently we are not doing any um, removal of the silt that was we were looking at solutions for our silting problem one of the um, we haven't dredged since the early 2000s the dredging as was demonstrated would have to be done every nine months to keep up with it it just kept filling in that's why they stopped dredging originally um, that's one way to deal with it we're currently just not dealing with it and then we're dealing with the, re the downstream repercussions of that um, the silt in our in our basins and you know, just the, the shallowness right there. So, okay. Um, so I think I think we could say that the intake could stay where it is because it doesn't have to be removed because of the silt. Silt is coming into the plant. It's being treated. It gets taken out in the process. It's not going out in drinking water. It's being taken out in the process. Gets put out in, with our sludge. So, and I, is there I think the cost that was provided. I would I would categorize that cost as somewhat of a comparative. They gave other options to help us uh, mitigate the silt problem, or you could dredge at a cost of, I don't recall the number right. that they gave. Mm -hmm. Also, but there, is there a cost now to mitigating that problem? We have not implemented any mitigation strategies. Oh, nothing's been, mm -hmm. so nothing's been done since that 2019 Burns and McDonald's um, report. Right, so when they submitted the report, um, and then we were in the comprehensive master planning phases, and we realized, you know, this is, if we're gonna be addressing this issue, it's probably something that should be included in the comprehensive master plan, so mm -hmm. we rolled it into that to review that intake study and look at the alternatives and then, you know, add that to the comprehensive master planning effort. Okay, and if we, um, if you considered looking for um, the next location, of uh, a water intake, um, is there, you know, looking at your elevations, etc. Is there a, a next location you might be looking at that's obvious? The general location is on the opposite side of the river. The final location is to be determined. In the in the draft report from Burns and McDonald, it was kind of a general location because of the channel is deeper and will avoid siltation. So we don't have a final spot picked because there's other considerations. The Fox River Trail, 
I think we have some wells over there that have to be considered. So as Director Bertrand said, that will be part of the study with the EI to try to better pinpoint where that would be and what costs will be associated. Maybe we have to relocate the trail. Maybe it impacts a well. That, so, and again, that, that wasn't really the scope of the Burns and McDonald. I'm not saying they left that out. They weren't asked to define to it that. quite that well. Right. And, I, I mean, there, <clears throat> you're not saying that there is no solution. There is somewhere a solution. It's not like engineer, engineering wine wise, we cannot find um, an intake that's appropriate in the Fox River without the dam. We put so, people so on the moon. Yes. Yeah, that's what right? I thought. Okay, thank you. So thank engineer, you. Well, engineers, I, engineers may come off as modest. We're not really. We think we can solve <laughs> no. anything. So we're going into well, this to, again, and we'll lay out a menu of options and, and right. try to resolve as many of these problems as we can. Right. If okay. we find out that there are some that are just yeah, it's you just, can't do A and B, we'll yeah. tell you, but when when available, we'll say you can do A and B. Okay. It'll cost you this, oops, this much, you'll have to do this, you may have to give up that. Right. So there'll be some, some give and take and pluses and minuses. And, right. So I, mm -hmm. we know that uh, keeping clean water costs money. We've, we've understood that now um, for many years and into our future. But thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I've got a couple questions. Thank you, uh, everybody, for the presentation. I, um, Nor, this might be a little curveball. If you don't have the answer, I, I'm fine. But um, in hearing the presentation, I went back through the materials, and City Manager Kozel got us a summary of the repairs done to the water intake in the past. And in 2022, we spent over a million dollars, and one of the main things we did there was a replacement of the West River intake bar screen, and then in 2019 it was $764,000, and that one included a replacement of the East River intake bar screen. Correct. So to a layperson like me, that makes it sound like there's an East intake and a West intake. Are those on the same structure, just opposite sides or next to each other? Or? Yeah, they're they're right next to Tim's, each other. Tim's nodding his head. He's yeah, like there's, he too. there's okay. actually, um, if you, you look at the intake, there's four holes in the side of the building. Um, the building up there, there's four holes in the side. Two of them are, we are on the east side of the building and two of them are on the west side of the building. So um, there's four gates, two per side, and yeah, it's just all in one building. So we just refer okay. to them as the east and the west in as they're located in the building. To a lay person like me, does that mean like east, I'm because I, I live near there, I, I walk the trail, I look at that from across the river. So the east intake is like facing up river and the west intake is facing down river um, as you're looking at that structure? Yes, yeah, so the east east intake is closer to Willow Lakes Estates and the west intake is closer to Judson. Judson. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're both, they're all right on the front of it. They're not aimed anywhere or anything. Okay, they're, they're right not facing side. up river and down river. No, they're, 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 on the, they're on the river side of the structure, just correct, up river yeah. or down river from yep. each other. Okay, yeah, that helps, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and just another question, I mean, assuming that we don't take the dam out, so all of the discussion about the water levels are gone, we still have an intake problem we have to deal with. Is that fair? Um, the, the siltation at the intake? Correct. I mean, Yes, it's an issue we would like to deal with. I don't know that it's required. Um, it, we don't have any any litigation requiring that we do that. It was more of an operational you know, right. improvement. We're always looking for ways to improve our operations. So, yeah, it'd be great if we could get the silt problem out of the away from the front of the intake, and then we don't have to deal with it. But you know, it's it's not it's not critical. It's not like the next thing on my list. <laughs> A lot of stuff on my list that has to be deal dealt with, and that's <laughs> be nice nice to do. Um, it's why we're planning for it, why we include it in the comprehensive master plan. Great. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mayor. I guess this question, like, I was kind of surprised. I don't know why I thought that maybe um, it would be harder. I didn't realize that the soil would be so soft like that. Uh, so that was kind of surprising for me. And the concern is... Um, 
Because it's soft like that, I just assume that a dam uh, is there to hold the water. If it's removed and it goes with the flow, then is, is that a concern because uh, the soil is so soft like that? Is that something that uh, is concerning? And, and if it you is... You mean for the length of the river, the full length of the river? Or for right the there? length, the width, for anything in the river. Yeah. Can I show the thing? So we actually, I think, had included in here some slides from the previous presentation that showed... So this is um, the dam, the bottom of the river, okay. right? So it shows, the top one is showing the dam, and it shows the saddle, and it shows the intake. The bottom one shows, or the middle one shows if the dam removed and the saddle remains. So that would be the saddle not getting washed away when the dam's removed, and what it does to the intake. This was from our September presentation. And then the bottom one is if the channel is allowed to erode away, which, you know, there's some pretty soft stuff there. So there's really nothing saying it's not going to erode away down to the natural channel level. So there's nothing holding stuff up. There's the, there, there's nothing holding it there. So mm -hmm. this is what it would look like is at that bottom, the bottom level, which was where we were concerned with the water level, the water surface elevation at the intake. Yeah, that goes that goes below where the intake can function. I see. Um, I think that what um, Councilwoman Rauschenberger said is we spend so much water, I mean, so much money to <coughs> clean the water to keep it clean, and that's basically what the city does just to make it drinkable. You know, I always say that we're spending millions and millions to put the chemicals in to maintain it. Um, it's just water so expensive, you know. Um, okay, those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Mr. Ortiz. Uh, thank you all for the presentation. I just have a, this pretty much one question. I mean, how long do you think it would take for it to erode away? If it's all sand, I'm assuming maybe not that long, but if it's a couple, little bit of clay, maybe a little bit longer. I, we how, much, would, how much rain are we going to get? Yeah, we would have no no way to, to determine that. We don't know what's what's going to happen this year. You know, hopefully this year we're not in a drought and we have more river water. But you know, if we get a big storm. Yeah. So it depends on the amount of. I mean, the, make this I'm not trying to be funny. It depends on the amount of water coming down the river, right? So if you have a heavy uh, year with lots of rain you have more water in the river perhaps higher velocities more energy coming down you could see more erosion if it's a drought year you're not going to see as much erosion so okay. it, it could vary but yeah I guess we could talk to people more knowledgeable in it and try to give you some estimate of how long it would take for this material to erode under typical conditions okay That's all I have it's hard to put a, a date on it after I retire. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I have a question for Mr. Holderman. Um, uh, you showed some elevations uh, when you did your borings. And uh, at what level uh, did, you, uh, did you find uh, something that would be relatively stable where you would say it would not erode? Is that, uh, you know, uh, we're looking at a, a pretty serious drop here. Yeah. In, uh, what, if we, these elevations go to the uh, where we thought the river bottom was. Yes. Uh, this the, this design here, correct? That's correct. And now you're looking at going. Well, you have four or five feet of silt or sand or whatever that's going to be removed. So that uh, that representation actually would show the river bottom being a little lower. Is that correct? Um, I'm I'm not familiar with exactly what the elevations are. On this particular, I see seven ten. Yes. So um, the we were about uh, 705, 706 was the bottom of the river, and we went 10 feet into that, so 696, 695, okay. and all that material would be easily erodible. Okay. So that elevation would be, uh, um, we're guessing that at that point, but you still have to go, you'd have to go even deeper to find something where it got to be extremely stable. Yes. I'm thinking, you know, I understand Mr. Pubins' uh, 
concerns, you know, and when uh, you have uh, uh, flows that go from 100 million, 100 million gallons a day to 2 billion gallons yes. a day in high flow, it will scour it out in a hurry. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so this actually could lower the river level there of, of feet below what we anticipate at, the, at this point. And yes. Yeah. So if the dam is gone, uh, this could lower that. I can't see the numbers here from here, but yeah. So it's uh, uh, we're going to see it actually lower than what we anticipated in the original uh, proposals. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, okay. You note that it's not going to go down below where the it's downstream of the dam, so it's not going to you know go any lower than that. So the downstream control will still be the same. So. Yeah, it could go down to that level as what the dam is. Yeah, at I mean, that we point. and then uh, then I start to think, well, where do you put the? Do you have to artificially create something to have the water retake? I think that's the uh, to have enough water to uh, uh, back it up. You have to put a, uh, uh, some kind of a structure there or dig a hole and, uh, and allow for water to be captured there. Otherwise, it may not be deep enough uh, to, uh, to fill the pipe, mm -hmm. fill a suction to the pipe. Okay, lots of engineering problems. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Dixon, you haven't spoken yet. Thank you. Uh, one question I get is uh, you all may be able to share in this. Um, but how much of what we're discussing tonight um, would or would not be affected by what our neighboring communities do that are also along the river when it comes to dam removal? Um, you know, does that, <clears throat> I'll just leave it open for does. Or you think you're yeah. a little more versed on flow hydraulics. You <clears throat> um, so when I talked about the hydraulic model and the downstream control, mm -hmm. um, so the dams themselves sort of create these mini areas, right? So the removal of, say, the South Elgin Dam, if that would, um, that's not going to impact us upstream of the Kimball Dam right. because it would impact the reach between the Kimball Dam and the South Elgin Dam, but not necessarily us up here. So um, as far as the impacts of all of the dam removals, I guess I'm hesitant to say. I mean, I would think you pull them all out. Does that so lower the Fox River um, level that it does impact? Yes, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, we're, we're looking very specifically at our reach. So mm -hmm. the Fox River is very um, flat. It's not really steep. So I don't know how much the downstream impacts would actually reach up to us. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And, and you know. Any of the dams before us, so north, coming this way. So if if the southern dams are not going to um, probably affect us, is what I is what I gathered, right? But you know, um, any possible removal of dams um, up the river, being north, that could remove their dams, could that possibly affect what we're talking about? Um, I would say that dam removal upstream wouldn't affect our hydraulics, but it would potentially improve our water quality um, as the impoundments upstream, you know, which is similar to our dam, right, they collect water, sediment and stuff. So as those are released, then we're not getting that water down. That makes mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah. you know, it would be advantageous to us to have upstream ones removed. Um, but as far as hydraulically, that wouldn't impact us. Okay. And so then are we you know, keeping track of what's happening with those other communities and what they are or not, are and are not doing. You already mentioned Geneva, I think it was, earlier in the presentation. You just talked about South Elgin. But we're tracking those um, yeah. here as part of our decision making. As best we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't have intimate details on what all their internal discussions are, but right. uh, Nora and I are both part of industry groups, right? We talk mm -hmm. to other people in those communities. And throughout the engineering community and water community. So getting okay. some feedback. And okay. I think a lot of the communities are having very similar discussions. Some of them we've read about in the papers, right? There's information out there, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just as a, a side note, the uh, uh, South Elgin Dam, uh, the impoundment or the reservoir above that dam reaches all the way into Elgin. And it could affect what happens with the riverboat. Uh, it goes that far. And uh, uh, 
that would have to be another engineering study to look where the channel, you know, we, we're, we're guessing here as to where the channel is going to go. So Mr. Holderman says, you don't know what's out there. And if it's silty or soft, the channel will, wa will wash that out and maybe uh, move that way. So that would be another study for uh, somebody else to do. Okay. Ms. Rauschenberger. Okay. Thank you um, for having another opportunity to ask a question. So, um, so looking at those three um, diagrams there, um, we can see that the, with the dam, that the, the water backs up, it gets deeper, and that's when we have uh, water sitting there and not moving as fast, and we have growth of algae, et cetera, et cetera, right? So when we go to the bottom, when the dam's removed, we have whoops, the natural stream of the river. Mm -hmm. So you see it's the same before or, or after. So that's fast-moving water that is, you know, uh, well, fast as, move, fast as the Fox River moves. Um, that goes on through there. And could you say that some of that buildup in, of the sand and, and silt and things like that is caused by the dam? Because if the natural river would have looked like the one on the bottom? Yes, so that's buildup from the, over the, that's why it's kind of soft and so if you take out the dam, you get back to a natural river. You don't have that buildup. So what we're measuring is silt behind the dam that's built up over the last 60, 70, 80 years. Okay, that's my point. Thank you. Um, the silt at the river intake is also, if you look at how the river is, um, it's, at, it's on the outside of a bend, so that also contributes to the siltation at the intake. Um, that on the outside of a bend, it's moving, it tends to deposit the, the, the silt. So that's also part of it. I think, too, if I could add, in the Corps of Engineers report, there's a diagram that shows distribution of the silt. And I think some might think that there's a solid mass of silt equally thick, like a wedge behind the dam. It's not really because of currents and things like that. So it, it, it's distributed differently in different areas. But to your point, Dams cause siltation. The velocity dam slows down. Dam. Heavier materials no, fall. The geology out. behind it is a dam. Mm -hmm. a dam. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you yeah. for all your work. Great presentation. You're very welcome. Okay. We have a couple minutes. Um, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's take a five-minute break. It's going to be a long night, and then we'll uh, reconvene at seven o'clock with the regular uh, city council. Do we need a motion? I'll, I'll move. We need adjourn. a motion to adjourn, we'll and we'll adjourn convene with the regular city council. At seven. Second. Been moved and second to adjourn. Court, please call the roll. Council Member Dixon. Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Ortiz. Yes. Powell. Yes. Rauschenberger. Yes. Stefan. Yes. Thorin. Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes, we are adjourned. We'll reconvene with the regular council meeting at uh, 7 p.m.
meeting for the Elgin City Council to order for um, March 20th, 2024. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, will the court please call the roll? Council members Dixon? Present. Good. Here. Martinez? Here. Ortiz? Here. Powell? Rauschenberger? Here. Stephan? Thorin? Oh, here. Mayor Sorry. Captain? Here. Approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of March 6th. Move for approval? Second. second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? No. <laughs> yes, motion's approved 8-0. Eight, uh, eight, eight um, no communications this evening. We do have some people signed up for public comment. And I give them a choice of uh, uh, signing up uh, most for the citizen review board and if you choose to speak first we can do that or if you want to wait until the uh, uh, this the last item on the agenda it'll be a, a little while if you'd rather wait till the end you can do that as well <coughs> That'd be uh, number four so Marcus Banner's chosen to uh, speak uh, uh, early in the program Disabilities, as well as collaborate with the so-called independent investigative firm to push false narratives to discredit the women he is victimizing. So at the end of the day, if this proposal does not give the authority to start investigations as the board sees fit, based on concerns brought forward by the community and have the authority to look at the all footage, all reports, raw, untouched, or redacted by law enforcement, as well as ultimately be the binding arbitrators, then this board is obsolete. I've made mention in the past that this proposal in its current form could be incorporated into the Human Relations Commission because I believe there's no need to create the illusion of something new. If this council decides to incorporate this framework into the Human Relations Commission, we would ask that new members be added that fit the demographics and live in the area that have the most police presence. This is because we believe they have firsthand insight into the good, the bad, and the ugly. <clears throat> to Mr. Dixon, I'm going to tell you publicly like I told you private back in 2019. <coughs> if you don't have the courage to fight for this board in the form beyond its, the comfort zones of those in power, then get out of the way for those of us who will. Because ultimately, there is only one thing worse than not acknowledging our forgotten communities have been victimized, 
And that is creating the illusion that the means of stopping it have been put in place. This is not the time for take what we can get. This is not a time for short-term political trophies. This is the moment of truth. In the words of Eddie Kane Jr., Mr. Dixon, if we're not going to do it right, then let's not do it at all. And I'll leave you as I always come, as one people, one voice, one community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sherry Liskey, would you like to speak now or would you like to wait? Good evening, everybody. My name is Sherry Liskey. I live in Elgin. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you for all the work that was put into the development of the ordinance creating a civilian review board here in Elgin. After years in the making, two days is hardly enough time to read and analyze the final product. That being said, I would like to share an, uh, one aspect of the ordinance that is concerning. Uh, well, actually, Marcus said it better than me, but that's... Okay, so a major purpose and duty of the CRB is to provide input and recommendations regarding civilian complaints. That is until you get to the last page, which basically says that the board has to suspend action upon, okay, so this is right in this ordinance, upon the written request of the chief, the corporation counsel, or, or, or any law enforcement or prosecuting authority, the board shall suspend any action with respect to civilian complaints whenever the action could compromise an ongoing criminal investigation or an investigation into an officer-involved shooting. Also, upon the request of the Corporation Council, the Board should suspend any action with respect to civilian complaint when, in the opinion of the Corporation Council, the incident which gave rise to the complaint has resulted in or is reasonably likely to uh, result in litigation against the city, its officers, or employees. So, <laughs> this is my opinion. This is the point of the review board. Look at the tough cases. Review and recommend action on the tough cases. Um, yes, do all the previous reviews, evaluations, recommendations, all those other things, but not restrain the board from taking on the cases that prompted the call for the establishment of the civilian review board in the first place. Community import, input analysis and recommendations are imperative for progress in our city's development and augmented public safety. Yes, vote for a, a, a review board and establish a civilian review board, but let it do its job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Denise Haven, I see you showed up and you signed up. Uh, would you like to speak now, or would you like to wait till the end of the till the uh, item is brought on the agenda? Okay, we'll call you then. All right, that brings us to uh, bids. The first item is bid number 23 638 2024 Bridge Rehabilitation Project Rebid. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we award this bid to Alliance Contractors Inc. of Woodstock, Illinois, in the amount of $519,828. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion's approved 9-0. Item two is bid number 24-005, code compliance contractual grounds maintenance mowing. Move to award the bid to Alvarez Inc not to exceed $33,000 for lawn service or mowing services. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9-0. Item three is a, a vehicle mitigation barricade system for Meridian Rapid Defense Group, LLC, U.S. General Services Administration Purchasing Cooperative. 
Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we award this bid to Meridian Rapid Defense Group, LLC, in the amount of $541,771. Second. It's been moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Item 4 is uh, APX 8500 Mobile Radios from Motorola Solutions Incorporated, uh, State of Illinois Joint Purchasing Program. Move, Move for approval. approval. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Howell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Brings us to other business. The first item is a resolution authorizing execution of a change order number two with John Burns Construction for the Riverside Water Treatment Plant Main Switchgear Improvements. I'll move approval. Second. second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9-0. Item 2 is an ordinance granting a conditional use for a planned development and for a temple in the RB dis uh, Residence Business District in the ARC Arterial Corridor Overlay District with certain, certain departures from the Illinois Zoning Ordinance, or excuse me, the Elgin Zoning Ordinance for 462 to 472 North McLean Boulevard. Move, Move for approval. approval. Move the second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, City Manager, I'm probably going to ask you these questions mm -hmm. since uh, Mr. Malat's not here. He so, is present, but oh. I, I can give it a shot if you want in the first instance. All right, so mm -hmm. does the applicant know about all the restrictions on, pay, on the second page, or page four of this agreement? About no parking, on, no off-street parking, they need, them needing a crossing guard, not going over the 64 space capacity, having more, more than people, them, the amount of uh, people at the mm -hmm. building, no... Uh, off street parking east of McLean, north of McLean Boulevard, no parking on Hendy Avenue, uh, restrictive parking in the neighborhood streets. Do they, uh, they understand all that, those. I don't have personal knowledge of that effect. I would imagine that they do. I know that there's been some changes um, that were. That Petitioner may be here. Oh, may here be we able go. To answer if, those questions. If, even better. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, very, very aware and accepting of the, of the, you know, the decisions. Okay. Um, understand we want to be good neighbors. Um, understanding that the city has already had trouble on, uh, on the uh, surrounding streets. So um, the organization is very committed to not causing any parking issues. Um, have uh, more than adequate capacity on the lot. Um, and uh, also committed to understanding that uh, it's a very busy street on McLean. So do not want to create issues with uh, even communicating to the congregation that they are allowed to park nowhere other than on the property. So very aware, very thankful, very good work from uh, the planning team. So happy to be here and answer any other questions you have. All right, thank you. I just want to make sure that you guys knew that all that was in there. Yep. They're, okay. they're very reasonable accommodations, so we're very happy. All right, thank you. Fine. So you might want to explain you made a good faith gesture as well and uh, involving a fence. That's right. Thank you. Um, it was a little above and beyond the expectations. It was, uh, you know, they're still doing some fundraising. They were very worried about uh, the impacts here. But understand that the neighbors would feel much better if there was a fence installed. So the organization has accepted the installation of a, of a fence for a full, uh, full um, length of the, of the property uh, if, it, if it makes people better. Our only concern was that when we do install the fence, we want to just be careful that we don't you know, sometimes fences, uh, the people who install fences really damage trees and take down trees if the trees are in the way of the fence. We just want to be sensitive to the fact that a natural tree screen is already present. So we'll work with uh, anybody who wants to work with us to make sure that we retain the trees for the village because I know you all like the natural look and feel of things. So, fence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Martinez, you have a question. 
Thank you, Mayor. I would just like to commend you because um, you've come such a long way from when we first started at the planning and zoning. And I really believe that you're trying to be a good neighbor. And um, I know that they put a lot of stipulations and that you're willing to um, go ahead and agree with that. Uh, it was just concerning because at first it sounded like there was gonna be another town coming into, into Elgin. But um, you assured us that that's not happening and that you uh, would take care of that. So truly appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a very wonderful team. They're here. Mm -hmm. They're senior scientists in Argonne. There is a physician who comes to Elgin to work every day. Mm -hmm. She works at Sherman Hospital. Mm -hmm. So you have a very good board. They want to be good neighbors. We look forward to a, a wonderful uh, setting and uh, contribute back to the community and look for ways to contribute back to the community. Fair? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are all not, we are a non-profit organization and we are all volunteers. Um, I'm Madhvi Rao. I've come to this board a uh, couple of times already. I'm a physician at Sherman Hospital and I've been practicing for about 18 years now. Uh, never had any issues. Uh, we've had various events in your own Elgin neighborhood. We've never had any issues with parking. We've always been good neighbors. Um, the fence was a little shock to us, <laughs> I'll be honest. It was above and beyond, but we said, well, if that will make them happy, we want to be the good neighbors. And we always want to make sure that uh, we follow whatever is needed. And we've been upfront and open with uh, the city planners and the zoning commission, and we'll continue to do the, so with the permits and everything else down the road. And we look forward to working with all of you all in the community. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Is there anything else? I want to, I want to reiterate call. that it was very good to work with the planning group. They were very professional, very well informed, and they gave us some excellent guidance along the way to make things happen. So thank you. Mr. Thorne, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I am curious. I, I'm the one that, uh, that went back there and looked at it uh, initially. And I felt that there wasn't enough parking. And now I see all the stipulations. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you have a plan if more cars do show up than you are allowed room for? What is your plan? Um, the temple is going to fundraise for the first phase, which might be only one half of the temple. And so for the initial few years, they're likely to not exceed uh, maybe 200 people, 250 people. So the, uh, the, the village planning team uh, essentially asked the organization to project the future and said, go to the extent of your projection and put it out there so we can see the full extent. So we don't expect to get close to that number anytime soon. Um, they have an agreement with the neighbor on the south side and uh, there is more than sufficient capacity to, um, when you fill up both sides, let's say five years down the line, if both halves of the building get filled up, there's more than sufficient capacity of 64 parking stalls on this property and the 32 on the property immediately to the south of the property to fully satisfy the needs. There's really no further need to go beyond. In my experience, though, as an architect, um, if there is an organization that, that projects a particular, um, you know, excess capacity. It's always uh, come, come down to the village, just let them know you have a special event, uh, talk to the neighbors, get an off-site um, police officers, reach the sheriff's department, make sure that everything is comfortable. I don't foresee that here, though. I think this is a much smaller congregation in my experience. And so I, I just don't foresee a situation where it's going to be exceeded at least in the next few years. Thank you. Ms. Rashman. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for coming to our community, and I welcome you. Um, I personally see this, um, these stipulations as much too um, uh, difficult, and, and I, I mean, I, I don't see how we can tell people where they can park if you can't park on the east side of uh, um, McLean Avenue, for example. So. I, I just feel bad that there are so many stipulations and that it, it rings to me like overly um, regulating 
your temple, but I welcome you anyway. <laughs> but I'm going to vote against it because I feel like it's not appropriate. I mean, not the, on your behalf, on our behalf. No, it's okay. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is uh, this is not the first time that any kind of a religious organization that moves into a community faces a little bit of opposition because of concerns from people around traffic, and it's kind of natural. And so I think it's the, it's the democratic way of working with the plan commission, having a few neighbors show up at a meeting, uh, voice their objections, hearing them out, figure out what the issues are, and make a few accommodations on both sides to make sure that the long-term relationships are healthy and maintained well. You know, everybody wants to just be a good neighbor in a community. So that's okay. Ms. Rauschenberger, I, I, it's okay. I, it might be excessive, but this is the process, and we are not too worried about it. It's what well, it is. You know, um, I think time will tell. Um, like I said, um, and most of our um, congregation is um, educated, highly uh, respectful of neighbors, um, you know, always uh, trying to do what is by the right. And so, and this is a very small congregation, and it's going to take us a long time. We've been in co congregating in various basements, and we are like 50, 60 people max. They asked us to project for the next 10 years, and so we were like doing some calculations and came up with these numbers, and little did we realize, had we just given the truth of what is happening right now, we would have been passed very easily. But I think they asked us to look into future, which none of us know how to do. So we did the best we could. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to comment and just commend you guys on everything. Um, a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago when you guys came, I know there was some confusion. Um, Definitely so on the planning and zoning, too, as well. Uh, but I really appreciate your approach uh, and being democratic and saying, hey, you know, we're going to work on this. We'll change it, you know, work with the condominium association and things of that nature. So I just want to say thank you for that um, because you could have dug your heels in. It could have been a fight. You know, it could have been an argument. It could have been a whole lot more. Um, but you kept your eyes on the prize and you did what was right by the people who will be attending your church. So very happy, you know, to have you here. Elgin is uh, known as a lot of things and the city of churches is one of them. Um, and so everyone has their religious rights to gather uh, as they choose. And so I'm going to be happy to support this tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Hey, I just have to say that when I first met with you and we talked about the first thing that came up was parking. Yes. And uh, we knew it was going to be an issue, and you did a great job and uh, very respectful in the way you dealt with it. And I think you respected the neighborhood and uh, try to make the best of the situation that we have, and we'll uh, move forward with it. So thank you very much. And we'll thank you. Move forward with the vote. We have a motion and a second. Court, please call the roll. Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? No. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? No. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion's approved 7 2. Brings us to item 3 is an ordinance amending chapter 3.08 of the Elgin Municipal Code entitled Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. Move for approval. Second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Yes, Mayor, Mayor Captain? Um, Ms. Powell. Um, if I could just ask staff to explain to the public why the changes are being made. Obviously, we have it in front of us, but if you could just kind of talk through it, that would be helpful. Sure, I can take that, Councilmember Powell. Um, um, language in the Board of Fire and Police Commissioner's Ordinance is um, language that's being deleted, establishes numerical designations for board members based on race and gender. Uh, the action is the amendments are being recommended in response to recent interpretations of court decisions in which similar provisions prescribing particular race, ethnicity, or gender um, um, minimum um, composition have been ruled unconstitutional. So we're making these amendments to comport with existing law. Thank you for the explanation. Um, disappointing, I understand why we have to do it, but um, these designations have been in place for a long time and for specific reasons uh, to make sure that there's um, adequate res representation from typically underrepresented folks in our community. Um, all I can say is elections have consequences. When you have a 
very, um, very conservative um, Supreme Court that makes these these decisions. They do trickle down to us. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez? No. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? No. Rauschenberger? No. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. The motion is approved 6 3. Brings us to item 4 is a community task force on policing recommendations, subcommittee on civil, uh, the civilian review board. Move for approval. Second. second. Moved and second for approval. Discussion. Mr. Ortiz. I think these might be for Chief Lally. I'm not too sure. <laughs> these are just uh, these are like three bullet points that I heard in, from our speakers, the concerns they had, so I just want to ask them. So one of them is like the, dis the uh, disclosure of discovery. So when you give the board of the discovery packets of the reports or videos or whatever it is, I've seen in the ordinance, you give it to them, but you redact identifiers from like victims and witnesses. What about the body cameras? Will you redact the body cams to the extent where they're not, they won't be able to get the full concept of what's going on? Or you just mute the audio when they say certain things? Uh, the, for, so to your point, the redactions in both the report the investigative report, any police reports, any other type of supplemental reports are redacted for privacy considerations. Additionally, so for the body-worn camera, we would redact witnesses, victims, and then officers because the purpose of a civilian review board to make their face, so we would redact their face. But what they're saying or what's happening, unless there's some certain thing that a witness says or a victim says, um, for privacy, medical information, something that if someone were to file a FOIL, we would redact out, we would do that. But generally, things that officers are saying are not going to be muted out. Um, the reason for redacting the officer's face, the witnesses, and the victims is so that when the Civilian Review Board makes their determination, it's based solely on what's occurring. These are, this is the incident. Here are the facts. Make the decision based on that. Not, I know this officer. I know the history of this officer. I may have had an encounter with this officer. Um, or a victim or a witness. So it's to keep a neutral and balanced perspective that a decision can then be made and a recommendation can be made toward to me. Okay. And then for, uh, there was a concern about suspension of inquiries. So I understand it because I work in the courts, but a lot of some, some people that don't work in courts are not attorneys, might not understand it. Why would you ask the board to suspend an inquiry on a complaint? So for example, in the event of an officer involved shooting some type of case that could be a criminal case, so maybe there's misconduct that's um, being looked at in a criminal nature, we may say, we're the, in our instance, the criminal case goes first before we do any type of administrative part. So we would say pause on this until the criminal case is done um, because of the fact that there might be people that need to be talked to, the investigative process. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that we're not intruding or impeding an investigation, especially if we're not the entity. So that's the purpose of that. So it's to allow for some type of criminal process to take place before any type of administrative process, which would include the Civilian Review Board. So you're bringing back in at the end once the state's attorney or AG or whoever, you're, you're bringing it back to the board regardless. Yeah, so okay. if the criminal case concludes, um, so in the case of an officer involved shooting, a criminal portion takes place first. We do not do any type of administrative case until that criminal case is done. Once the criminal case is done, then we do our administrative. Because if an officer is charged, there may be not any reason to do any type of administrative proceeding other than to move forward some type of process to terminate an employee based on the fact that they have a criminal case. It just depends. So this would allow us to say, 
this criminal process is taking place. Let's just pause. Let's see what this is. Once that part is done, then we can move forward with the administrative process. Okay, so the board will have a chance regardless. Yes. To look at it. Okay. Yes, it's just a it's a temporary pause to allow for, um, you know, the second part where you know the litigation against the city, the officers or employees. I would defer to Corporation Council back on that part. Um, I imagine that the city wouldn't want us, you know, having conversations if it would impede that type of process. Yes, I mean, in reading this uh, provision, council member, uh, certainly if, you know, there's a threat of litigation arising from an incident, uh, if the actions of the civilian review board, I think, would uh, adversely affect the city's interests, I think we would want the ability to protect the city's interests. I think that would be important um, in any sort of investigation, giving the civilian review board the opportunity to review it at an appropriate time, but certainly not expose the city to any uh, adverse risk in litigation. I think that's the purpose and I would support that. Okay. And then uh, my third one, I think I heard one of the uh, speakers were asking about the makeup and the structure of the board. I see on the last page, I think it was the last page, that it would be members of the police union, a couple members of the police task force, and somebody, I'm trying to find it. It's like a makeup of different people on the, during the selection process. So can you like, explain how, why you, how you guys came up with that idea? Yes. So there's two things. Um, the, the composition of the board, uh, initially when the ordinance was written, it had to be amended, uh, basically what City Manager Kozel just explained about the police, fire, and commission. So that's that part. The second part is um, having a selection committee that's formed that would select the people that sit on the civilian review board. Um, I had conversations with uh, Councilwoman Powell and some members of the task force. Um, when I was here, I think it was in March of last year when this first went up, one of my uh, main points I had said um, is that in order to have, for this to work, right, it, it's, you have positives, you have negatives. People might look at a city and say, why do you have a civilian review board? The police department, you know, is it's a bad department. Um, there is that negative connotation with that comes with us. The other side is transparency, accountability, involving the community, right? All the good things that I think everybody in this room, regardless of where we stand, I think we embrace that. So part of that is the police officers. And so in order to have, in my opinion, a fair and accountable, transparent, all those words, you need to invite the people at the table, the police union, to be able to be involved in that process. And so I had reached out to Councilwoman Powell and said, can we have a conversation about this? And can we you know, put in the ordinance who the selection committee would be? Um, and having three people who were on the task force and who listened to countless hours of conversation, processes, they probably understand the police department uh, you know, more than an everyday person because they were involved and they listened and they had conversations. Um, I think it's appropriate to have people who are balanced. So having the police chief, having a member of the union board and having three community members to then interview people who would want to be on a civilian review board, to me, I, don't, I think that's a fair ask. Okay. In the spirit of transparency, openness, and moving forward together. And then keep in, if I can add, those recommendations then come to the council yes. and we make that final decision. The council has final say. That would just be a recommendation from the selection committee. Okay. And then I think I have one more. Hold on. I've been, I was skimming through this while I was listening to you. The east side, west side thing. So that was another concern about appointing people in neighborhoods that those residents seem like there's a lot more police activity in their neighborhoods. So. Why did you guys divide it at the river besides, instead of dividing it by like neighborhoods within our community? Um, I'll defer to Corporation Council. That was uh, when this ordinance was written. I think some of the conversation initially just had the race, gender, and I think this was in the original ordinance, but I, I'm not, I'll defer to him on that. Uh, Council Member, I think if I understood your question, the question was why the river as opposed to some other geographic limitations? I mean, uh, geographic limitations don't implicate the Equal Protection Clause, which some of the other uh, criteria for like membership that are being removed uh, did implicate, and that's why those were removed. Uh, the geographic dividing line between east and west 
doesn't have any equal protection implications uh, with respect to why that was the geographic boundary chosen. I'm not, I wasn't involved in that and I don't know why they chose doing east side of the river, west side of the river, as opposed to some other um, geographic okay. designation. That was the recommendation from the task force. Okay. okay. All right. That, that's all my questions. It's what the speakers had. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Dixon. Thank you. <clears throat> Chief, can you explain the role of the law firm uh, in the, as, it, as it pertains to the sport? Yes, so the city ordinance that we currently have in place, the outside investigative authority, um, their role is any type of matter involving use of force, breach of civil rights, discrimination, criminal misconduct, serious injury or death, or any type of charges that seek the removal, dismissal, um, or suspension exceeding three days, those cases um, are given to the outside investigative entity. So nothing would change in that process. So a complaint would come in if it fit that criteria, the invest outside investigative entity would take the investigation. So that process remains in, pr in place. Okay. So in other words, the law firm doesn't take all situations. They do not. It has to meet a certain threshold. It has to meet a, correct. Right. Okay. Um, can you um, also explain the the history of, uh, of this ordinance, of this proposed ordinance uh, from, the, from the inception? Um, in terms A of- A quick overview. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think the easiest way is just to say, obviously the task force was created during those conversations, the civilian review board um, came up and one of the recommendations that the task force made was to create a civilian review board. Um, there were different asks uh, and eventually you know there were certain conversations an ordinance was created it was presented to the council I believe in March of I want to say March 23rd of 2023 um, at that time uh, corporation then corporation council Bill Cogley uh, also administered a memo um, with my uh, with my memo that basically outlined three concerns the concerns were the makeup of the of the board uh, the second concern was um, <coughs> From what I remember, uh, civilian, it was the oversight in terms of them, that civilian review board making the final decision on discipline because the task force made two recommendations. One was to have the chief have final say, the other was to have the civilian review board. Uh, and last concern that Mr. Cogley uh, was subpoena powers. So in his memo, he gave the reasons for why we should or should not do it at the time then the pause was put on the conversation. And so here we are today. So that's a short version. Okay. And, and maybe corporate counsel can speak to this. Um, when it comes to um, the civilian review, review board having final authority, can you speak about that aspect in relation to, uh, and to the law and, you know, I guess agreements with the union? Sure. With respect to the... Uh, civilian review board having final disciplinary authority uh, that's contrary to what's provided uh, for in city ordinance and specifically the collective bargaining agreement with the police union um, is kind of laid out in uh, Mr. Cogley's memo which was uh, of March 16, 2023 which was included in the uh, committee of the whole packets at that time uh, there's he viewed it as implausible that the union would agree to uh, change the ordinance and um, have their agreement renegotiated so that the civilian review board, excuse me, civilian review board would have final disciplinary authority. He didn't view that as a plausible outcome. And he looked at the other ordinances some of the other communities had. Um, none of our comparable communities had such provision. So if we really wanted to push that issue and take it to some kind of uh, arbitration um, where we tried to uh, have that inserted into the agreement uh, he didn't see that as a, a plausible outcome where we would be able to win that in some kind of uh, arbitration so based on that he it was his recommendation that that not be a power of the civilian review board that just would not be plausible okay and can you speak to the subpoena power sure in the draft ordinance based on the recommendations and our existing ordinances um, and the way he drafted the ordinance, the civilian review board doesn't have a, it's not an investigative entity. So because it was not, 
in reviewing the recommendations, that's not how it was set up. It was more to review the investigations and to make recommendations, but not to independently investigate things. Uh, he concluded that there's really no purpose for a subpoena power uh, as it was proposed. So that's why he did not include that in the final draft of the ordinance based on mm -hmm. his memo. Mm -hmm. And Chief, uh, you and I had some conversations about the subpoena power uh, in particular. Um, it's my understanding from what you uh, advised at the time that if there are any documents, anything that's, you know, needed, you know, to be, to be provided to the uh, Civilian Re Review Board, um, that you would have no problem doing that, you know, one day you won't be chief, but that's a part of the powers of the chief to request those documents and they have to be provided um, per that request from the board. Yes, and I think it, you know, uh, in terms of if the Civilian Review Board is there to review a, a matter and then provide a recommendation to the chief, um, the chief should want to provide everything to them so that their recommendation is complete and thorough. So, um, you know, if, you know, if this is put in place and we get any, rec any requests that they're going to make, then of course, I mean, that's the purpose of it. And so I think, you know, whoever the police chief is after me, um, you know, to not give uh, a board the information that they need in the spirit of cooperation, um, you know, wouldn't make any, that would be counterproductive to what we're trying to do here. Because the first thing it will do, it will erode the trust between the civilian review board and the police department, starting with the police chief, which mm -hmm. then you can see how that can filter down. So. Um, and in the ordinance, too, there's also language. Uh, I believe it's um, on page five under additional administrative support. The department shall redact information but also make available to the board members all materials and records as it may reasonably require in the performance of his duties. So there's some safeguard and protection in the language in the ordinance as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, but as it relates to witnesses, people, right? Uh, we already know if it reaches a certain threshold, the law firm gets involved, right? So in those more serious cases, the law firm will be doing the interviewing, which is already taking place um, in in serious uh, situations that occur. So yes. the okay, so the law firm would do those, conduct those interviews and things of that nature, and those documents would be provided to the, uh, to the Civilian Review Board. Yes, so the, right. when the law firm uh, gives its report, it has all the information in it in terms of who they spoke with. The Civilian Review Board may come back and say, you know, why wasn't person A interviewed? And at that point, we would make the law firm available to answer those questions. I'm not going to answer those questions because I'm not the one doing the investigation. And to keep, um, you know, to keep the sense of, fairness and you know it truly be independent i shouldn't be involved in those conversations until if whatever the civilian review board wants to see wants to hear let them see it let them hear it and then let them make their recommendation to me so if need be then we could contact the law firm and say there's questions in terms of this that the civilian review board has that they need answered before they make their recommendation can you please provide an answer to that and it may be a simple thing we tried to interview this person they wouldn't come forward um, that would be documented in their report or maybe you know, that's new information or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, and uh, who drafted the document, The what's being proposed tonight? Who, who drafted it? The ordinance? Yeah. The legal department? The legal department drafted yes. the ordinance? Okay. Yes. I'm and not I, an attorney. I, yeah. That's not a setup question <laughs> no. for you. No. Right. That's not. Because <laughs> I'm making a point because I certainly didn't write it. No, 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 okay. no. The, no, our attorneys do. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's since I was called out by Mr. Banner. I just want to tell you, brother, I love you. Hold on, hold on, let me talk. You talk, I didn't interrupt you. Hold on, hold on. I didn't interrupt you. I didn't interrupt you. When you spoke, I'm going to talk, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. You had your time. I never interrupted you. You had your time, and I respected you as a man. I let you speak. I never said anything. No, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, so hold on, hold on, not true, we did have a meeting, we did have a meeting, was nothing at that point was drafted, it was the idea, no, there was an idea, the idea was to have a civilian review board, okay, I brought forward the idea of having a civilian review board, I put it up for vote, 
and everybody voted on it, and it was approved. I intentionally stepped away from the task force when they were reviewing or going over and creating uh, this ordinance. I had no part in it. As a matter of fact, we voted to appoint Councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Powell to the Civilian Review Board to be as a liaison. Corey had nothing to do with it. Corey intentionally stayed away from it. You see, but Corey did what he was supposed to do because Corey don't just talk. See, Corey gets stuff done, right? And what, and what Marcus does is he just sits there and does a whole lot of nothing. You know, he, he, he ain't completed anything. He ain't completed a thing. You ain't completed a thing, all right? You talk a good game, you get people riled up, and you do nothing. You have no accomplishments. You have no accomplishments, right? And then, and then you're not even professional. You think, you think, no, no, you let's said my to name. Stick, and let's then, try to stick to the uh, subject. Here. I, 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 listen, hold on. You think, you think that because you say something that people are just going to listen. You don't even make no sense, bro. You don't make any sense. You act like I wrote the ordinance. I didn't write the ordinance. I didn't write the ordinance. I didn't write the ordinance. Listen, you had time on the task force to do something about it and what you do. You didn't do anything is what you did. All you did is speak. You did nothing. You, you did nothing. So to, in conclusion, in conclusion, in conclusion, I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish right now. I I'm second it. Recess. You I guys second can it. sort this out. Let the council uh, get, uh, take a seat. And you want to complete nothing and do nothing. Doing nothing. You completing nothing. We'll take the recess. We take the recess. <laughs> we we'll take the recess. Yeah, all the all this black empowerment, black together, man. You care about yourself. You full of hate. That's all you found. It's personal to you. That's where you messed up. It's personal to you. It's personal.
Nixon, you have the floor. Do you have any further questions for the chief? Uh, no additional questions for the chief. I think things have pretty much been covered. Okay. Uh, no, no, no additional comments. Um, I think that's pretty much been covered. But I'll just say uh, to Mr. Banner, I welcome a conversation to talk about all of the issues. All right. Um, if you ever want to have a sit down, I'm open for it. I've had them multiple times with you. I've never steered away from them. We can have one again. Whatever is whatever we can have, we can have all the disagreements. Okay. But I'm telling you, and I'm saying publicly, we can sit down and we can talk about all the issues. Okay. So with that being said, I'll just end my comments and let everyone get to theirs. Thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Ms. Rauschenberg. Um, thank you. Uh, I know that the ordinance isn't perfect, and, um, but I'm going to support it tonight as a start, and, and there's opportunity to, after it's going, to change what we think needs to be changed and not. I understand that, you know, we've looked at other ordinances of other communities, and um, they're, it's similar um, as far as their um, capabilities and reach. Um, I just had one question about the selection committee. So the selection committee originally will come from the, the um, task force, our um, police task force, citizen task force. But what happens um, in the future if all of that committee is gone or no one on that, uh, the task, I mean, if everyone on the task force has moved on or they're not interested in participating anymore, then who's the selection committee made up of? I think it has to have a future. Yeah, I think if, you know, uh, this would be good for this uh, ordinance, people would be in place for a while. For a while, yes. It's a yes. staggered term. That's I right. think it's like 432. Um, so at some point, if that the ordinance needs to be revisited because of what you just said, right. uh, then I think that that would be a conversation with the legal department in terms of general community members, right? It doesn't have to be specific to task force members, okay. just like any boards and commission that the city does now. Okay, yeah, that's just a thought. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Mr. Good. Uh, Mr. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to all the task force members who are here, um, all of the ones who are not here, um, in participating in those meetings from watching uh, the task force meetings. You all put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, as we're seeing highlighted tonight. Um, there's a lot of passion involved in this. Uh, the devil's in the details. So that's. I just wanted to say thank you to, and to you, Chief, and staff who uh, sat in on all those meetings. Um, and I guess to touch on the point of where this ordinance starts and stops, um, I think I was always of the mind that we put as much in place uh, as possible. And what the task force fought for is you were able to work with a chief and a police department that was willing to at least hear the ideas. Um, in some cases, agree wholeheartedly. In some cases, meet you halfway. Um, but there is still the room for the public and the community. Um, so in the scenario that was highlighted today, uh, if a future police chief for some reason decided not to work with the task force, uh, or I'm sorry, the civilian review board, um, that would cause a scenario where, I mean, jobs are on the line, um, elections will be swayed because of that. And I think that's the mechanism that is, as, though it's not immediate, or not immediate, but as quickly as we might like it to be in some cases, um, there is still the mechanism of general democracy that we have set up locally. Um, to try and address those things. So um, in hearing from some members of the task force, and obviously uh, there's, there's some disagreement still amongst uh, those members, but as well as the liaison, um, I think we are ready to move forward with this. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll see the comments from my colleagues as well as how the vote shakes out tonight. Anybody else? Mr. Thorne. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I do compliment the work that went into it, the task force people. Uh, the chief, um, but not everyone is for this type of thing. Uh, I know I speak for many citizens. I mean, I, I believe the perception factor holds a lot more strength for a lot of people's opinion. A lot of people are thinking, why would we need that? What's wrong with the police department? There is a negative connotation that it sends, and a lot of people pick up on that more than they pick up on other things. 
they, if you value one more than the other, or that's how you work, that's how your mind works. Uh, that's certainly the way I feel, and I know I feel the similar way to a lot of people. Um, I'm not for a civilian review board because of the, oh, the situation is who could be on it, how might that change, but mainly the perception. The perception also for recruits, the perception for the, for the officers themselves. So I, I'm just letting people know that that's where I stand. Thank you. Else. Mr. I'll, I'll try to add my thoughts to this. Um, mine are closer to uh, Councilman Good and Councilwoman Rauschenberger. Um, I've been watching the development of this and um, been waiting for this to come forward. I honestly had some of the concerns that I've heard other people voice, uh, including Sherry and Marcus. Um, but this this proposed review board and what it's going to do is fits right in what I often say about a lot of things that we do uh, at the city and it's it's that it's not a set and forget situation we're not doing something and walking away and just letting it go um, much like the private investigations um, I will be taking this seriously I take those seriously I read those ROI reports um, as long as I'm sitting here, my goal is to make sure we don't have this go back to the way it was. And I don't see it doing that right now. And I appreciate the chief and her staff's efforts. A lot of times they're doing things before we can even get our heads around it. You guys are way ahead of us. Um, I'm not naive to think that that's the way it's always going to be with the police department. And what I'm trying to do is create a system of checks and balances where if things don't go right, things don't go the way they should, people are treated differently, then we have some way to catch it and we have some way to start a process to remedy it. That's my goal. Um, again, I appreciate the work that everybody did on this task force and the work that's going to go into creating this review board and I will be supporting it but I will also be watching it to see that it's doing what we intend it to do. And it may need tweaks. We've had some tweaks with the investigati investigative process and we may need some here too, but we'll see. All right. Anything else? Ms. Paul. I intentionally wanted to be last. Um, but I did want to first of all acknowledge our task force members that are here in the audience. Thank you so much for being here and for all the work that you put in over the past few years um, on the community policing task force and specifically on the civilian review board. Um, where do I start? So when we talked about how did this come forward and where did it first emerge from, I'll even go back a little bit further than what you did, Chief. Um, this was brought up, I know, by at least by me and probably by some other folks sitting here, uh, about the need to have some type of civilian review board uh, six years ago um, when DeCynthia Clements was killed in 2018. Um, so it goes back at least that far for me. Um, I know that there are folks that aren't in agreement with this, that don't feel that we need it for whatever reason, um, feel that it shines a negative light on, on the community. And for those folks who don't feel like we need it, I'll say that those are typically the folks that aren't um, unfairly uh, treated, don't feel, they don't have the same experiences as other folks have in this community. Um, that's where this com that's where a lot of this comes from. Um, for folks who don't see where it's needed, they've probably never been pulled over by the police and harassed. They probably never felt like they were untreated, uh, treated unfairly by the police. Um, so I just want to bring that up. When we talk about diversity and inclusion and transparency and including everyone in our community, 
and community policing, it's got to be for everybody. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And I see this Civilian Review Board as bringing our community policing full circle. Right now, our community policing is primarily focused on our police coming out into our community. This Civilian Review Board brings it full circle because these citizens will now have some say in how they are being policed. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Is it perfect? No, it's not. And there are a lot of reasons, as we've talked about some of those today with Supreme Court rulings. Um, I think one thing that didn't come up was um, state law, um, the um, policeman's, um, I forgot what it's called, the state law. Police yeah. Officer Bill of Rights. Police Officer's Bill of Rights. Um, a lot of reasons why some of the recommendations that came from the task force could not be fully implemented. Um, when we looked at a lot of the civilian review boards across the state, none of them, including Chicago, that has paid civilian review board, um, the chief, their police superintendent still has final say. Um, so I say all of that to bring us back to this is a starting point. My goal, I think all of our goal, hopefully, is I want to make sure that we are bringing this back and looking at how it's operating one year into it and on an annual basis, what's going well, what needs to be tweaked. This is an ordinance. So if there's something that's not going as we originally intended or if there's something that we missed, we need to take that opportunity to bring it back. And, and specifically, and I know this came up specifically during the task force um, conversations, if we continuously see a pattern where the Civilian Review Board's recommendations are different than what the police chief's ultimate recommendation is, that's a problem. We need to come back and look at what's going on and how do we fix that? How can we fix that? Because um, I don't want anyone to feel like they are wasting their time. Um, one of the other things that came up was subpoena power. And the reason why the Civilian Review Board wasn't given subpoena power is the fact that uh, they are not the investigatory body. I think I brought this up during a, a previous session when we were talking about our outside investigator. Um, <clears throat> that they currently don't have subpoena power, but it may be a good idea if they do. Um, and I know that is coming back before our council probably sometime soon, um, and that may be something we, we want to consider giving them. Um, I was really hoping that we could have more language in this ordinance that specifically laid out who sat on this board, racial makeups, um, who's having the interactions with the police. That was something that came from the task force. That was something that I talked about with staff and corporation council um, afterwards. And again, because of the uh, recent Supreme Court decisions, a lot of those types of um, designations have been ruled unconstitutional. Um, again, unfortunate, but I would hope that as the committee is looking at who they are recommending to us and as we make those recommendations that we take the whole of what is going on in our community and who has come to us repeatedly with concerns about policing in our community. Have things improved? Absolutely, I will say that. I believe, and Chief, you're, you've been a big part of that, so thank you to you and your, your leadership team. But you're not always gonna be here. 
and things that have happened in the past, old, old wounds don't heal very quickly. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be cognizant and um, take this seriously and make sure that the intent behind the formation of this board is actually realized. Um, I'm committed to that. It sounds like from a lot of the comments from my colleagues tonight that uh, they are committed to that. I know folks that are in the audience that are here that are committed to that as well. Um, so thank you, and um, I'm not sure if there's any more folks that wanted to speak. I know that there are some people in the audience that wanted to speak. And I, obviously I will be supporting it. I'm the last council member to get to speak. And, uh, okay. Sorry, no, he's forgetting me. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to speak and I'm going to say things that a lot of people are not going to like. But I've always felt this way as a community leader. Um, people are always trying to um, say that we don't have any experience, really, you know. I'm Latina. The experience that I had with the police department back in the 80s and 90s was not a good experience, especially with a lot of people with a language barrier. And it happened to me. It happened to me where I was stopped, and just, they just assumed I didn't speak any English. So I spoke Spanish, right? And um, everything was in Spanish until I was insulted, you know. And, when I was insulted, that's when I stopped it. Okay, and I think he was surprised that I knew English. Okay. But I know people in the community, in this community, that they were wrong by the police. They're people that will probably never become residents, people that will never become citizens. But they still live in this community. And I can talk to them now and say that what happened in the 80s and 90s, we look at now, we, we changed as a community, we changed as a police department. And the reason why we changed is because rather than being victims, we became warriors. We stayed to change it, okay? What happened in our community back in March of 2018 it was very, very tragic. It was awful. My disappointment is that that was a great opportunity to bring the community together and heal, and my disappointment is that there's people here who divided our community, divided it. And that's unfortunate because I think that was a great opportunity to bring us together and see what happened. And instead it made it worse by making this task force. I've always said it, I've never changed. I was against the task force. And from this task force, yes, some things were done. There's a lot of meddling, I think, from the beginning. When you had 75 people from the community who volunteered, who applied, Right, and we were told, we were instructed to bring it down to 25, okay? And we did, and from the 25, we were supposed to select 18, and we did. But what I was surprised in the meddling is that of the 18, two of the people of the 18 were not even of the 25. That's when I became suspicious. I said, this is wrong, okay? And then at the end, there was only 11. And this is such a long process. It was two years from the moment that we started talking about it to the moment that it ended, but it really didn't end, because that's why we're here right now. It cost us half a million dollars. And the things that were said during that civilian, during that task force, you know, I, I appreciate that the, that the community came in and this is what they were asked to do and that they stuck by, and there was quite a few missteps in that. 
you know, offending veterans, things that were said about veterans. You know, that uh, um, trying to go ahead and, you know, when you give um, points for being a veteran, they try to bring that down. Trying to defund the police, trying to bring the number down to less police officers. Yeah. Uh, there was a recommendation to take away the bachelor's degree. We voted seven to one, but it still somehow <coughs> turned up on the task force. Thank God the task force was smart enough to realize, you know what, it wasn't a bad idea, that's good. Why? Because we're going through this process of trying to recruit people to come here, trying to change that bad image. What I don't like about the task force, the Civilian Review Board, it is the perception. It is the image. Algin already has a bad image, and I think we've been making it worse. Um, I'm glad that the police department was not defunded. On the contrary, I'm glad that they recognize that we need more police officers, and that's what happened. You know, but I think that these things that changed from the, from the task force that were good, I think it was said earlier, the police is way ahead of us. They would have figured it out. But we went through this process. We went through this. And I, I come to the conclusion that we are not going to make everybody happy. I get it. But it's proven to me, in my opinion, that there's some people, no matter what we do, we're never going to make happy. And I really believe that there's going to be meddling in this again. We went and we got a law firm that was outside to investigate because to me it seemed like the perception was that we don't trust who was the person who decided or investigated here in the city. You know. Again, another expense with a law firm. I voted against that law firm. But you know, it turned out that it was okay because it was an outside entity. But you know what, that's not good enough for people anyway. It seems like no matter what we do. And what this is doing, aside from damaging our image, aside from um, making it harder to, to be a police officer now, but I'll tell you, from 2014 on, the police department has changed a lot. I see more police officers that look like me. I see more police officers that look like our community. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that good? For a city this size, a city this size, we don't have the problems that other places do. We really, really don't. Is it perfect? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not, you know. I remember sitting in these uh, task force meetings and I remember the question being, being brought up about, you know, how bad are these um, uh, accusations of how bad the police officers are. Most of the time, they were brought up by the police department themselves. I hate to use this word, but the police themselves. That was the majority of the complaints that were coming from the police department itself of things that were going wrong. Because you know what? It's the image, their image. Because whether you believe it or not, people, somebody does some wrong, something wrong, and they call us all out on it. You know. Um, to say that I don't have any experience, I do. But what, what I try to do is to change this, and like I said, to be a, a, a warrior, you know, not, not a victim. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I don't support this. Thank you. Uh, I have just a comment, and uh, I think that, uh, I think this is part of a process. I'm gonna support it. It's been a process this city's been going through for a decade. And that process is to allow the people that live here the easiest way they can to have issues with our community. We started 311 for that purpose so people could complain about 
just the fact that they pick their trash up. And it's something as simple as that. This is much more complicated than that. But I want people to be able to feel comfortable, to come and file a complaint, not be afraid, and be able to get their issues resolved as the best that we can do. And again, that's been said about 10 times today, is this perfect? No, it's not. I don't know of anything that's, I, one guy told me at one time, there's only one thing perfect and that's God's perfect. So this is it, this is significant for this community. It's a first step and there may be modifications as we get onto this in the future and we do that, we do that all the time. But I think this gives uh, people an opportunity to uh, uh, go to a civilian board and file a complaint. That complaint will still end up over there. And, but it gives them the feel that they can deal with their own, with people of their own, of their own uh, uh, stature. And it's intimidating for people just to come here and say that we have a problem and to go up there and speak. They're not public speakers. It's a huge process. And I think this makes it better. I think this is gonna make it better for that. And uh, that's my hope anyway. And uh, I look forward to uh, maybe having future discussions here as we make some modifications. So. It's really, uh, really quick. Now let's wrap this up and, and we have uh, Ms. Haven. I still owe you a, a, a chance to comment. Yeah, okay, Ms. Rauschenberger. Yeah. I'm just quickly gonna say a list of the, the cities in Illinois that have citizen review boards and this is just the short list. Springfield, Champaign, Rockford, Aurora, Bloomington, DeKalb, Chicago, Evanston, Urbana, Rock Island. These are communities that where people, you know, it doesn't mean that their police force isn't wonderful. That's all, thank you. Okay, Ms. Paul. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to do really quickly, one of the civilian, um, the community task force members, um, Dr. Um, Josh Brockway, wasn't able to be here, but he submitted a letter, and I just wanted to read it into the record. Um, it was sent to the entire city council, but um, I thought it was important for um, everyone else to hear it as well. Um, it says, members of the Elgin City Council, I am writing to you as a member of the Community Task Force on Policing. Though our work finished up some time ago, I see the ordinance forming the Civilian Review Board as a key milestone in the work we started. I am writing in support of the CRB and wish to share one observation and two reasons why my support continues. In the time since the formation of the task force, the word progressive has been cons consistently used to describe the Elgin Police Department. Having read all of the policies and sat with command staff, several officers, and most recently, all of the fair and impartial policing instructors, I can say that the descriptor is accurate. However, when I hear city leadership use progressive as an adjective, it is almost always in a defensive tone. It is as if the CRB and addressing discipline and disparities in policing is a threat to the reputation of the department. Nothing could be further from the truth. Community policing is the foundation of the Elgin Police. Establishing the CRB, to me, is an extension of that policing model, allowing informed and trained citizens to have a voice in the disciplinary actions and assessment of policing data is an important part of providing community input in the way the community is policed. Community policing is not just coffee with a cop or social media updates or stats or recent events. It is a mutual dialogue. The CRB codifies the community input. Two aspects of the current CRB ordinance stand out to me. First, the ability to review and assess policing data is an important step forward. As we saw with the, with the partisanization of the CPE and NIU stop data, we need, to, we need a better way to assess and understand the data. Talking points and positional manipulations of the narrative at council meetings will not help us as a community understand what the data means, nor will other organizations trying to use our community to impact national policy debates. It will take citizens and professionals asking hard questions of the information and of one another. The CRB ordinance, as, is, as it is written, provides that needed venue for debate and understanding. Second, in the time since the task force began its work, I have come to value the transparency and integrity of decision make and decision making of Chief Lally and her command staff. While I have come to trust 
their judgment, I also know that they will eventually retire. Trusting individuals is one thing, yet putting in place structures and practices to maintain the trust rather than counting on personalities is a key part of having a CRB. I hope that the city leadership will always raise up and recruit the best, and I see this board as a bridge between the character of our department, command staff, and the trust of the community. Thank you for bringing this recommendation to a vote. Respectfully, Reverend Dr. Joshua Brockway. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Haven, you get the last word. Good evening, Mayor, Captain, and members of the City Council. I'm very grateful to be here before you to celebrate this historic occasion. The final vote to approve the creation of a City of Elgin Civilian Review Board. It's been a long time coming. I won't repeat the full history. However, if you think about it, the recent history includes the shooting death of DeCynthia Clemens at the hands of an Elgin police officer in 2018, six years ago this month. Thank you, Councilwoman Powell, for saying her name at the last council meeting. We as a community lived through the peaceful protests that occurred in Elgin and around the, around the country. The community called for a better oversight of the police department, and the city of Elgin answered affirmatively with the creation of the Task Force on Community Policing. We began our work in, on 9-30-2021 and completed our work in August of 2022. The process was bumpy to say the least, but we got the work done. Recommendations from the Task Force were presented to the Council on 9-14-2022 and the Committee of the Whole voted to move forward with the task force recommendations to create a civilian review board to provide oversight and input related to the activities of the police department on March 22nd, 2023. And here we are today, March 20th, 2024, the first day of spring, and an historic occasion to take this final vote to approve the creation of a civilian review board that's been called for by a number of our community members for years, for years and years and years. I believe the stories and the narratives that folks from our communities told me back in the 2000s. So in actuality, it's like two decades we've been talking about the Civilian Review Board. The wheels of creating new legislation at the local level indeed move slowly, but at least they've moved forward in this case. The ordinance that is before you doesn't precisely follow the recommendations made by the task force. There have been items removed that I would have loved to see be contained. Some of the language has been watered down However, that's the art of compromise. Before you is an ordinance that will provide some redress for past wrongs, including the wrongs that happened to you, Councilwoman Martinez. Before you is an ordinance that will have community members be a part of a process that they had no access to in the past and will offer increased transparency on disciplinary actions when complaints against officers are made. To quote my friend and task force colleague, Reverend Josh Brockway, from his email sent to all of you, community policing is the foundation of Elgin Police. Establishing the CRB to me is an extension of that policing, mo policing model, allowing informed and trained citizens to have a voice in the disciplinary actions and assessment is an important, important part of providing community input in the way policing is done. Community policing is not just coffee with a cop or social media updates. It's a dialogue. And the CRB codifies the community input. The wheels of creating this new and historic ordinance indeed moved slowly, but at least they have moved. 
I urge the members of the Elgin City Council to do the right thing tonight by voting yes to creating a civilian review board. And so I say thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Would the clerk please call the roll. Council Member Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? No. Ortiz? Yes. Howell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? No. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 7-2. Consent agenda. Move. Second. Second. Move the second for approval. Any uh, discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council Member Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. A miscellaneous business. Move, Move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Question, Mr. Ortiz. Uh, it's the minutes for the Culture Arts Commission. Uh, I think the missing uh, Miss Powell on here. I want to give her credit for being on the commission. Uh, I might have been absent at that meeting. Okay. <laughs> All right. That, that was it. All right. Thanks for looking out for yeah. me. I wanted to be reflected the same because on the portal on the website <laughs> that her attendance is, doesn't get messed up. Okay. Right, <coughs> uh, court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion's approved 9 0. Announcements. The next committee of the whole meeting will be Wednesday, April 10th, 2024, at 6 p.m. in the City Council Chambers. The next regular meeting of the Elgin City Council will be April 10th, 2024 at 7 p.m. in the City Council Chambers. I had entertained a motion to adjourn back to the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Second. Second. Move and second to adjourn. Court, please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, we are adjourned. Now I entertain a motion to uh, reconvene. So moved. Move. Second. Move and second to reconvene. Court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. We are back in session. My Mr. Manager? I believe we're on number on letter C. Letter C. Is that correct? It is correct, Mayor. Thank you. This is electric vehicle charging network expansion. This is the 2024 Project Engineering Services Agreement with Hampton Lanzini and Renwick. Engi this engineering services agreement with HLR provides for electrical design and construction oversight activities associated with the expansion of the city's EV charging network. This agreement contemplates design and construction oversight at eight city-owned locations. The project aims to begin the work necessary to add EV charging amenities at the city's regional parks, excuse me, Wing and Lords, the Elgin Sports Complex, Bose Creek Country Club, Highlands of Elgin Golf Courses, plus the expansion of public charging options in the Robert Gilliam Municipal Complex. If that's not enough, also included within the agreement is an analysis into the feasibility of future fleet EV charging capacity within the rear parking lot of the Edward Schock Center of Elgin and at the Public Works facility at 1900 Holmes Road. Move for approval. Second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Here, Mr. Thorne. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> well, I still have my concerns for electric. Uh, it's not that I don't believe that they will be uh, a wave of the future, <coughs> but it's at this moment. Uh, I'm curious as to where the city even is on its return on investment at this point, the cost that we're putting into these, the fact that the charging stations have been proven that they don't work when it gets too cold, and even as of recently, major car manufacturers have stopped manufacturing electric vehicles, and Hertz just abandoned their electric fleet. I'm not in favor of this at this time. Mr. Manager? Public Works Director Aaron Neal is here. He can provide some information on the plans for moving forward with the electrification of the city's vehicle fleet. 
How are you, Mr. Neal? Well, you're fine. Thank you. Good evening, Councilman Thorne. All great questions. All great points. Um, like everything else that we do within this organization, we try to be objective as possible when it comes to our research. Um, and what we found is that slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? And that's the approach that we're taking here. Some research that we have, um, while EV growth rates are projected to slow in 2024, uh, it is to be noted that in 2023, for the first time, the EV industry eclipsed 1 million vehicle sales, 1.2 million vehicle sales. Year over year from 2022 to 2023, it was a 49% increase from the year prior. Early projections in 2024 are that, is that the EV market is still going to increase up to 1.5 to 1.6 million units sold. It's the growth rate that's going to slow, and it's going to come down between 25 and 30%. So still year over year, the U.S. is still producing and selling more cars. Um, as far as return on investment, and as it was written in the memo, um, the city isn't as much looking for a return on, on investment on our EV chargers as much as we are trying to make amenities in the city at locations that we know that people gather, whether it's Bowes Creek or the Highlands Golf Clubs, Wing Park or Lord's Park. Um, putting amenities where people are, I think, is very important for us. From a municipal standpoint, you know, some can say, are we too early? Are we, when are we going to adopt this? From our standpoint, going slow now, maybe five years from now is the right time to get in the market. But if we continue at this pace with very strategic, uh, controlled, and accurate decisions, in five years, we're going to be in a place where we're prepared for what is the time. Just today, the Biden administration and the EPA signed into legislation new uh, standard emissions control, which isn't as stringent as it was a year ago when it was um, presented, but still by 2032, they want between 35 and 60 percent of all vehicles manufactured to be EVs, and they want another 13 to 30 percent manufactured to be hybrids, whether plug-in hybrids or full hybrids or some variation. That was just today. So I believe that where we are now as a municipality of our size, um, in Kane County, uh, understanding the metrics of vehicles that are in Kane County. Uh, I have that here this evening. We have 4,000 EVs in Kane County. There's 26,000 EVs in Cook County, and there's 15,000 in DuPage. So kind of our three, our three counties, which are right around us, there's just under 35,000 EVs. And I think it's prudent of us to provide some amenities to people who are going to be coming to or visiting our city. Um, Hertz, indeed, you did mention Hertz. Um, they indeed did fire their CEO, and they set off on a mission to procure 100,000 Teslas in 2021. They only purchased 60,000. Uh, in January, they said that they were going to sell 20,000 of those. It's a third of their inventory. Hertz was too soon. I think Hertz and their, their CEO, and while they're selling off vehicles, is because it was a poor business model. Hertz didn't buy or build the infrastructure necessary to maintain their fleet. So imagine going on a trip from Chicago to LA, and you get to LA, I'm going to rent a car. Who wants to rent an EV? Because when you come back to the airport, Hertz didn't invest in the infrastructure to charge that EV, but yet they still charge the fee if you brought the car back at a lower charge rate, right? So it's a, it's, they were five years too early. So they're selling off their fleet because of, I think, a poor business model. So while all these things are true, and if we can put partisan ideas, you know, aside, when we look at it objectively, I think the rate that we're going at and providing these amenities to the community is spot on. Thank you. Anything else down this way? Good evening, Mr. Neal. Thanks for being here so long with us. How you doing, Council? Uh, for the locations you have listed here, yeah. on page bottom of page two and beginning of page three, for the sports complex, is that the existing 
that's already standing, or is that like the expansion piece? No, so that is for the existing section of the sports complex. Um, I have been in contact with the Smith Group through the Parks and Recreation Department as it relates to expansion, the sports complex expansion, and the EV charging stations that they want to include. We want to make sure we get the same makes and models and that everything is uniform. Uh, the proposal and the engineering design that's in front of you this evening is for the existing facilities within the sports complex. So if the new section has EV chargers, we want to make sure the current two hubs uh, that are out there, soccer fields, and all the other amenities also have access to EV charging. Okay. And then for page four, you have the screenshots of the financials that Mr. I guess Mr. Thorne was alluding to. Yeah. So for October, it says that we the city collected about four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Did we break even then? And th would that cover the electrical costs of running those stations? Yes, it one hundred percent covers the cost of running the station. So through ChargePoint, it's a software company that also dabbles in hardware, right, so the actual uh, charging station hardware. Um, we have estimates that our electric use from the charging stations are about 10 cents per kilowatt hour is what we are being charged by ComEd. What we did in October is we set up a fee of 15 cents per kilowatt hour, which is just a little bit more than what we're paying out, but also because ChargePoint charges us a 10% fee for doing all the financial work. They do all of the collecting of fees, and then they turn around and write us a check at the end of the month. So we believe that the average over these last six months of $368, I don't have it in front of me, uh, is indeed covering just our electric costs. No revenue being generated, okay. covering just the cost to power the stations, and then ultimately power the vehicles that are plugging into it. So we really have like no net loss then, right? Because no. the fees will cover everything. Correct. Okay. Cool. I mean, we are paying for the capital costs to, yeah. to build the stations, actually procure the stations, but to operate the stations, no. There's okay. no cost. Um, I think that was it. That was it, I think. All right. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Ms. Rashman. Yeah. Um, I just want to say um, on behalf of the Sustainability Commission that we do support um, working toward zero emissions as, as the world moves forward and we support um, uh, putting in uh, um, electric, you know, charging stations as well as, you know, and in, in slowly increasing our own fleet toward electric. Um, and thank you, Aaron, for proving all the points. Um, and I think the, the question of ROI, I think, um, I don't know if we measure return on an investment in everything we invest in roads every single year, mm -hmm. um, which is millions and millions and millions of dollars. But it is infrastructure, what communities need mm -hmm. to be a community. So thank yeah. you. And, and throughout this process, as we engage, you know, actually um, constructing the stations, we are seeking grants out through Commonwealth Edison, ton of opportunities and grant dollars through the federal government and the state government. So we are looking at ways to offset the actual purchase price um, and installation of the charging stations. So we are taking advantage of those opportunities as well. This agreement that's in front of you tonight is just for that foundational design work that Hertz probably should have done before they invested in 60,000 EVs. Um, just to do that work, again, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, and that's the direction we're working in. Uh, Ms. Pollard. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Neal, for being here tonight and uh, moving forward uh, with the EV um, charging expansions. Um, I think we're, I think we're at the right speed at the right time. Um, it was mentioned that, you know, the electric vehicle sales have been declining like this year, but I think what people need to understand that a lot of the incentives and rebates um, at the state and federal level that were tied to EV mm -hmm. car sales ended. And that did have a definite impact on the sales because people were very incentivized mm -hmm. to purchase. And they, and they still are. 2024, the, the federal government is still offering $7,500 for certain models. So that, certain that models. is through this fiscal year from the Fed. Yes. And I think, but there was one at the state level that didn't, I don't think you yeah, had the, the state funded one for about, uh, it was $4,000 state rebate that I think it was only for 4,000 Illinois residents, but still yes. those 4,000 could get both the Fed and the state rebate. Yes. Um, 
So I'm glad to see us expanding when I go into other communities um, that we commonly compare ourselves to. I do see more and more charging stations popping up and they're not sitting idle. People are actually using them. I've had, I have friends that have purchased electric vehicles, um, not quite for me yet, but <laughs> I, I need to be able to get home to Michigan on one charge uh, to see my family and I can't do that yet. So uh, gas it is. Um, but I'm, I've, I'm really excited about this. I guess my one question is, are we working with um, our other partners like Metra um, and uh, the the bus uh, Pace. transfer? Yes, Pace. Thank you. Um, to make sure that they're putting in EV stations, or how we can partner with them to put in EV stations in our community. We have not crossed that bridge yet, but it is definitely something that we're thinking about. Um, the Metro lot, uh, national big timber, right? Big lots. Um, you know, yeah, it's, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. I don't know what that partnership would look like. Uh, it could be some some sort of uh, fund sharing or cost sharing for the installation. But yeah, we could definitely begin those conversations to at least see where they're at in the process of providing EV charging to Elgin residents who are parking, and then again utilizing um, alternate transportation. Yeah, those are just you know, you these are some really good locations that are listed, but those mm -hmm. are some of the ones I think that could help really help fill in the mm -hmm. gaps um, at, at those lots and in particular at the rideshare lot um, just off of 90. Mm -hmm. uh, those would be really great places that would make sense to have um, EV charging stations. So thank you. No problem. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Um, I, I feel like we've had this conversation so related far. to EV in one way or another multiple times, you know, it's either about buildings, it's about parking, it's about you know, the vehicles themselves. So I'm not going to belabor the point. I, I just want to um, to show my support for this uh, and uh, my appreciation for city staff's work on and work on this and being so diligent mm -hmm. and making sure that we're going about this the right way and not overdoing it. Um, and that's, uh, and seeing you rattle off the numbers and mm -hmm. and and actually put things in perspective as far as yeah. what we're doing here is um i think it's really impressive and i and i appreciate it yeah. so i'll be supporting this tonight yeah. thank you there, there are some lofty goals from the federal government and i and I, I think they're lofty um illinois governor pritzker wants a million evs on the road by 2030 that's a big ask when today we have ninety six thousand in the state but if scaled appropriately um the interest is still there, the market is still there. EVs represent 10% of the new car market currently. I think providing some amenities to the members of the community and those passing through is important yeah. amenity for the sixth largest uh, city in the state of Illinois. Yeah, so maybe there'll be a million and one because the next vehicle I buy is gonna be electric. Yeah. I just bought my last you know, gas vehicle, yeah. so we'll see. I, uh, I walk the walk, I talk the talk. We bought an EV in March of 2023. Oh, okay. So, the range anxiety, all of the things that people deal with, the Neal family is dealing with, and we've, get, we've gotten over them. Um, you know, while we didn't buy the vehicle uh, as my role leading this project, it was important. Uh, and we, we own one. We've drove to Iowa. You can make it to Michigan and probably a charge, Councilwoman Powell. One charge. <laughs> Not one. One charge. Stop, right. charge, all and right. then go. Um, right. But I, I think that was important. A lot of people talk about range anxiety. A lot of people talk about... Um, in the cold weather, does, do you lose range? You do. I lost range, about 20% of range. Um, but for the day-to-day, -day, for 95% of our, our driving, um, we take the EV. Today, Nikki had to go to the city uh, to do some work. She took the EV, and I took her gas-powered car to work today. So um, it's worth it. Um, we found benefit in it. We're one of the 96,000 in the state of Illinois, and uh, you know our next car as well is going to be another EV. So. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Ortiz. I remember my last question. All right, let's do it. It took me a while. Uh, the Tesla conversation brought up. Are we going to, uh, are all the chargers going to get switched to the new plug once all the, like Ford, GM, Chrysler adopt the Tesla charge plug? 
Yes. So another big transition that the uh, major United States automakers are making is that in 2025, everyone is adopting the NACS, North American Char Charging Standard, which is the Tesla charge plug, um, GM, Ford, Chrysler, everyone has adopted that. So when all of the manufacturers adopt that in 2025 and put them in their new EVs, it's only going to boost the availability of over-the-road charge, charge uh, infrastructure. Uh, but we have had early conversations even before we bought the chargers that we have now in our municipal lot. Uh, we talked to ChargePoint, and they guaranteed us that they are going to update all of the current plugs to the NACS so that our vehicles are going to be up, up to date for 2025. So, yes. All right, thank we, you. we are scheduled to make that transition. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Neal, thank you very much for all the information. I love the fact that your objectivity, um, that the capital cost, that kind of reminds me of, you know, we have these parks. We maintain them. It costs us. We're not trying to, we don't make money out of it. But you know what? We make a great community out of it. That's what a community is about. Uh, I love that you bought your EV. It was a mild winter. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I feel that uh, initially people had put the pedal to the metal and wanted to go they did. EV, EV. They did. And um, I like your slogan about uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You know, that's very smart. And that's what I love about... Um, our staff, you know, you guys are the ones that uh, work full time. This is what you guys do, and thank you for continuing to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon. Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Ortiz. Yes. Powell. Yes. Rauschenberger. Yes. Stefan. Yes. Thorin. No. Mayor Captain. Yes, the motion is approved 8 1. Item D, DePage Street Combined Sewer Separation Project Engineering Services Agreement with HR Green Incorporated. City has a combined sewer system serving approximately 3,000 acres in the central part of the city. Within those 3,000 acres are 11 combined sewer outfalls that discharge combined sewer overflow into the Fox River. The city's combined sewer overflow long-term control plan identifies the city's intent to separate all of the storm water flows from the combined sewers to reduce overflow volumes and improve the water quality of the Fox River. During the course of the comprehensive master plan work um, being conducted, the DuPage Street combined sewer project was identified as being a priority that the city should um, commence work on in 2025. This agreement provides for the design and bidding services for that project. Move for approval. Second. second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Oh, oh wait. Carol Hadley. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't no. see you. Right. Uh, uh, was this um, un identified with the work they're doing in DuPage, or it's a different part of DuPage? Different part of DuPage. Oh, okay. This was, as they were looking for the highest priorities, okay. basins with overflows, this was the one that came up to the top. Anything else? Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Item E, the Summit and Dundee Avenue intersection improvements project. This is change order number one. Back uh, last March, the city approved the construction award to Plody Construction. Work began on the project in April and was stopped one month later in May because of the proposed improvements, uh, unforeseen conflict with existing gas utilities. Uh, following the resolution of those utility conflicts, Plody resumed work in July of 2023 and worked until November 22nd when the weather stopped work for the season. This change order enables Plody to resume construction work, not later than May of this year, and provides an extension of contract time and a revised construction completion date of September 6, 2024. The extension of contract time affords Plody with sufficient time to complete the work as described in the original agreement, a time accommodating for time lost due to unforeseen utility conflicts. In the absence of this change order, 
Capote would be subject to costs for not completing the work on time. Move for approval. Second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item F is an Illinois Department of Transportation letter of understanding for maintenance obligations associated with U.S. Route 20 from Grace Street to Lavoie Avenue. IDOT's preparing to advertise for bids on the section of U.S. 20 between Grace Street and Lavoie Avenue. Although the improvements are primarily owned and the responsibility of IDOT, the city does have some water mains, street lighting, sidewalk connections, and other minor improvements within the limits of this project. This agreement clarifies the ownership and maintenance obligations for those various improvements and establishes the obligations for each entity individually and in some cases cooperatively. Because there are no city-owned utilities being relocated by IDOT within the project limits, there is no immediate cost to the city with this letter of understanding. The city, however, will agree to maintain in its existing and ongoing maintenance agreements those amenities that exist within the IDOT right-of-way. Move approval. Second. Moving to second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Ortiz. Uh, is this going to go on at the same time? Oh, let me go back. Is this going to improve the Illinois exit where the cars kept going into that neighbor's yard? Are they going to try to fix that issue? That is, but that's not immediately part of this project. We're working on that separately. So well, let me put it this. The, tw the U.S. 20 improvements from Lavoie de Grace, we've added the additional component to do the reworking on the Illinois Avenue intersection, yes, where people end up in that gentleman's front house, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head from the similar intersection on the south side of 20. Oh, yeah. Those two components are being added to to reconfigure those outdated and essentially unsafe right. exits. Okay. So, and I'm assuming this is going to be done or start this part of the project in 20 after the 21 and or the 31 and 20 intersections done? Are they going to do it all at once and be a hot no. mess? No. Well, and again, it's not us that are doing it all at once. This is your friends at IDOT. Yeah, yeah I'm saying like, they're going to do it all at once and make <laughs> yes. everything a mess, right? That is correct. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. Court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. <coughs> Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion's approved 9 0. Uh, item G, the U.S. Route 20 and Ryan King Road roundabout project joint funding agreement with the Illinois Department of Transportation. While IDOT's in that name, this is a city project. The U.S. 20 and Ryan, Ke Ryan King Road roundabout project located at Elgin's West City boundary area next to Pingree Grove will allow for the replacement of the existing substandard intersection with a multi lane roundabout. The new configuration will improve traffic flow and safety through this intersection and address the needs of both local and regional development. The city is receiving $2.5 million in federal surface transportation funds secured through the Kane Kendall Council of Mayors. These funds are administered through the Illinois Department of Transportation, which in turn requires Elgin to enter into a joint funding agreement. Approval of this item will commit the city to the appropriate balance of the project costs currently projected in the amount of $1.3 million. Move for approval. Second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Good job. And Mr. Washington. Only glad to see a, a roundabout. And if you're uncomfortable, some people on our dais maybe don't go that way. <laughs> this one's going to be a little bit bigger than the ones that we're used to. So. It's properly designed. Properly Please designed. Call the exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. The motion is approved 9 0. Item H is a construction engineering services agreement with Bravo Company Engineering for the U.S. Route 20 and Ryan King Road roundabout projects. Bravo Company mean anything to you, Council members Ortiz? <laughs> and Martinez. Anyway, this agreement authorizes Bravo Company Engineering to oversee the construction of the upcoming Route 20 and Ryan King Road roundabout project. Uh, Bravo will be providing field inspections, design interpretation, contract administration, and project coordination to ensure the timely and proper completion of work within the project area. Like the move for approval. Second. Let's move to second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. 
Good. Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Item I, automated fire station alerting hardware update with Digicom Incorporated and U.S. Digital. The Emergency tele Telephone System Board, ETSB, approved updates to the fire station alerting system at all fire stations. These improvements will bring the fire station's alerting, system, uh, alerting systems up to date, providing more efficient and timely emergency response to the community. Uh, just right now, there's multiple instances where wiring in the ceiling speakers was inappropriately connected. Uh, that caused reduced audio levels and then sometimes instances of highly elevated audio levels. So we're going to try to keep the sound consistent with the alerting across all these stations with these upgrades. Move for approval. Second. Move the second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. <coughs> Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes, motion's approved 9-0. Item J, Kane County Child Advocacy Center Agreement for Investigating Sensitive Crimes Involving Children. The KCCAC, as it is called, is the division of the Kane County State's Attorney's Office, and it investigates and prosecutes serious physical and sexual abuse cases against children. KCCAC has been providing investigative services to the city since 2020 at an annual cost of $35,000. Last year, KCCAC investigated 131 Elgin-based cases, and that represents about one-fourth of its total caseload. Given that significant caseload, KCCAC requires financial assistance from the city to support its investigations. Um, but in April of last year, the Elgin Police Department also assigned a part-time detective to KCCAC due to the number of cases originating from Elgin. This part-time detective investigated 41 Elgin cases, and in uh, 2023, that assigning officer was in placement of a significant, was, was used in, in lieu of a significant price increase from the $35,000 annual fee. Police Department is recommending the approval of the contract with KCAC <coughs> for $35,000 and will continue providing a part-time detective to assist the unit. Move for approval. approval. Second. second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Ortiz. <coughs> um, I support this, but I'm gonna abstain from this because I work in this office and my salary doesn't come from this fund, but I used to supervise this part of this division, this unit within the office. So uh, I support everything our, our attorneys, our investigators, and our support staff does within uh, the CAC. And they do really good work and they keep people and put people in jail that need to be there that mess with our young youth and young, young kids. So I'm full supportive of our child advocacy center, but I'm just going to abstain from the vote. Anything else? Or please call the roll. Council um, members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Upstairs. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? <clears throat> yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 8 0 with one abstention. Item K is the purchase of an all traffic solution speed trailer and radar speed signs. The speed trailer and radar speed signs are a multi, our mobile multi-use radar message sign. It is web-enabled and it allows for data collection and remote management by the police department. The message sign and trailer are designed for mobility and rapid, rapid deployment, allows an easy transport, setup and collapse, and are used to address and deter speed complaints in various areas of the city. The radar speed signs can also be used to disseminate messages for approaching motorists, additionally enhancing motorist safety and communications process. Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Ms. Uh, Rauschenberg. Um, yeah, no, I'm glad to support this. I know um, I have had many um, citizens talk to me about speeding in our um, neighborhoods and on, on our streets. So I appreciate the police department being, as usual, proactive and, and um, meeting the needs of our citizens for safety. Okay. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Item L is the renewal of the uh, customer service software called Spider Tech, used by the police department to manage customer service interactions. 
Um, the software allows for a wide spectrum of services designed to incorporate relevant data from the police department's records management system to gauge if its members are providing satisfactory custom service to the customer service of the community it serves. Spider includes three modules enabling automatic and customized text and email messages to one, victims of crimes and reporting parties that provide information to, uh, on the police officer's arrival time, also provides critical information regarding investigation, and has mobile-friendly surveys composed of questions chosen by the police department that are then used to measure community trust and satisfaction. Spider also includes multilingual functionality that enables the police department to solicit and provide information in multiple languages. This is a renewal for a three-year term. Move for approval. Second. second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rocherberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9-0. Item M is a professional services agreement with Inquest Consulting, LLC. The city in 2022 entered into an agreement with Inquest for diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting services in an amount not to exceed $160,000. That initial agreement included working on a current state assessment and initial structure for the city's DEI strategic plan. Throughout this time, Inquest has demonstrated an exemplary dedication, working closely with city leadership to lay the groundwork for the city's DEI strategy, while also providing invaluable support along the way. With the organization progressing towards implementing the DEI strategic plan, Inquest proposal emphasizes its role in facilitating this process and fostering inclusivity through tailored learning experiences designed for both staff and city council members. Inquest's flexible and customized approach is consistently aligned with the organization's needs, making them a valuable partner in this endeavor. Inquest remains committed to supporting the DEI leadership team throughout the selection and onboarding process for the DEI role, ensuring a seamless transition and continued success in the city's DEI initiatives. This uh, recommended contract is in a not to exceed amount of $200,000. Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Yes, Ms. Powell. Thank you. Um, this question is for the city manager. You mentioned um, inquest um, and their involvement with uh, the DEI role, the position that we approved um, a few years ago. Could you give us an idea of what that timeline looks like for them to um, complete the work, um, putting together the job description and, and posting the position and interview process at all? Uh, the job description is completed. It may have been posted today. And so it'll simply be a question of going through the posting, going through the interview process, and see uh, what re what is returned in terms of candidates. So based on the executive recruiting that's occurred within the past couple of years, I would okay. imagine that that's about a three or four month process at the outside. Okay. At the outside. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, if you give me an opportunity to add that um, beginning in April, there are going to be 15 organization-wide sessions for every city employee occurring through three weeks, focusing on the city's efforts to launch its new DEI strategic plan. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rauschenberg. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad to see this on our agenda. Um, will a city council be included in any of those sessions? I expressly mentioned that based on the request to do so that I heard last year. So, yeah, that will be planned. Thank We're you. We're going to start with the employees, and then based on the information that comes back from that, begin moving. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Announcements from the Council. Mr. Ortiz? I want to give a uh, shout out to the IT department, Mr. Constantino's team the city manager's office, and I think the clerk's office was involved in this. The, uh, when I got on the council, I was asking for uh, more transparency in our boards and commissions. So if you go to the cityofelgin.org, then go to uh, find and click on boards and or want to, click go to boards and commissions. The boards and commissions attendance schedule is on there, any uh, openings, 
and their minutes, everything's more easily to uh, navigate and find. So people that want to volunteer in our city and join a board of commissions, we currently have an opening for the Heritage Commission and two openings for the Human Relations Commission. So people out there, please apply, because we need some good people like you to uh, give us some advice. Thanks. Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Uh, I would like to apologize to my colleagues for the interaction that I had with the resident this afternoon or this evening. Uh, it is uh, uh, not my normal reaction, certainly, and it was out of character. So I hope I'm not judged by, you know, a worse moment. Uh, but uh, for those in the audience and for those who are watching at home that witnessed that, uh, I would like to give my apologies. So uh, you'll never see that from me ever again. That I can guarantee. Thank you. Apology accepted. Okay, anything else? Okay. Announcements from staff? None, Mayor. Thank you. Entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session. So moved. Second. second. Moved and second to adjourn. Court, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorin? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, we are adjourned. After conversation with the, with the uh, manager, um, we're going to uh, uh, kind of defer the second item on the executive session tonight. We have to walk all the way across to the other side, and uh, that'll take us 15 minutes to move. And Ms. Martinez has a hard stop at 10 o'clock. So we can defer this till uh, uh, the meeting in April, the first meeting in April when the agenda should be a little bit um, easier to deal with.